All right, today is February 21st, 2021, and we're continuing our discussion on the Desiderata extinction nadi. And in today's agenda, looks like we're cutting it up into a few pieces. Um, what are conspiracy theories really? We're going to go into young and archetypes and shadow and in any review of the practical exercises. So um, I'll, I'll start off, I'll, I'll say um, I tried the novelty exercise last week and uh, just right off the bat, I noticed that uh, just after doing things that are out of my normal routine, I just, uh, I was, I wouldn't say flooded, but I had ideas. Uh, I, I was sudden, suddenly I, I got ideas that I never really had before, um, ideas that, um, uh, like, I guess one example was um, I was always um, afraid or I, I, I didn't really like contacting anarchist groups in along um, my area. And I just thought, you know what, why not? Why not just shoot, uh, we're in um, COVID time. So I know they're not meeting, but just shoot them an email. And then I, I also um, contacted a mutual aid group just to um, see, hey, um, what are you guys doing right now um, uh, in the community? And um, yeah, so j j that's just something that uh, that caught my attention, and uh, it's a good exercise, definitely. That's that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. It's basically you just expand your horizons a little bit. That's really nice. Thanks. Yeah. And, yeah, let us know how that goes. Don't be. Oh yeah, so far, um, yeah, they haven't really. Uh, they've just, yeah, they just mentioned they're they're not really uh, doing much at the moment, but um, they're. It looks like mo what they're doing is mostly like group discussions, also, and they they do book review or book. Um, yeah, they just they do a lot of discussions at the moment. And uh, I'll, I'll see how the mutual aid group goes, because I know there's a lot of um, uh, like people looking, uh, having trouble during this time of COVID, or looking for food or shelters. So, yeah, definitely, I'll, I'll keep up with them. Yeah. Yep, it's, um, it's going to be a lot more of that, I think. So it's kind of good for the future. Put put out networks and stuff like that. Is um, put out feelers to networks is a good idea. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Did anybody else try it? Did they? Well, I didn't actually try it. It kind of happened. Um, it it was just a small thing, but it was a. I mean, I was just washing my hands, and uh, you know drifting along on autopilot perfectly, you know. And then I turned around to to uh, use the towel and uh, I was uh, noticed that, the, you know, like really getting into the feeling of the towel on my hands, it was just suddenly like, wow, that, uh, this is just so cool. <laughs> It, it was, it, it, you know, like it, um, it was just in that moment for some reason, something had, had completely stopped, switched off autopilot. And this was, uh, you know, whatever was happening was really happening. Um, and uh, yeah, it was <laughs> quite interesting. Um, uh, and that, kind of made me think that the moment of novelty um, it, it, it comes back to this uh, question of it's going to come back to the conspiracy theory discussion I could see everything was looping around was that in a certain sense for the, a situation to be novel you you can't do it you can't sort of premeditate it um, you can you could set it up like Michael's just talking about but then it's going to do something that you don't expect um, because if you expect what's going to happen, 
it's no longer new for you. Um, you, you know, you've, you've sort of basically cheated. You've thought it out. Um, uh, but I was uh, thinking about it in relation to the conspiracy theory be, theory discussion because um, if you uh, that, that seems to me to be based around around this idea of everything must have a doer. Every everything that you see coming up must have somebody behind it. That's that's uh, that's planning it. And uh, the little incident that I had uh, was just sort of, um, you know, made you realise that, that things don't aren't pre aren't they're not premeditated. We 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 think everything's got to have a cause, and um, come up as a result of some. Um, I don't know. I'm sorry, I got it a bit lost. But you, the the uh, just the, the fact of of a, of what are, what arises just um, happening. Out of out of as a, as a result of everything, rather than being, you know, a, a, a premeditated thing. I don't know if you want to say something about that. I I, I did it too, the novelty exercise, and I, I I just very briefly, it just I realized how much I had absolutely no routine in my life because I was doing things, and whenever I. I don't know. It just one day is diff always different, and now is different to another. I don't have a, a set. I was kind of trying to say, where am I going to introduce a novelty? And then it helped me to 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 what Gary was saying to to experience things. Even though I didn't introduce a thing, I but it's it's it was a door to 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 the now. Even though it was really not intended, I don't know what was the intention behind the exercise, but that's what it—that's what it did for me. Yeah, it is really intended to be a door to the now. Uh, but it made me think what you said about uh, what you wrote and on Reddit. <coughs> the the aim of the exercise is really to get people out of being mechanics, just doing things automatically like a machine. So um, it didn't really occur to me, though, you know, about somebody like you in your situation where you don't, you're not set in a routine. Most of this is for breaking people out of slavery because, you know, I've said so many times that slavery is all based on the clock and repetition and um, getting into a routine. And that's um, part of your incarceration, so part of your liberation is to, to break out of that routine. But if you already <laughs> don't have much of a routine, yeah, then uh, it's it's not applicable. The first, um, the first exercise is applicable where you just come to your senses. So it's, it's, a, it's another route to your senses. But yeah, if you don't have something to break out of, then it's, um, you know, it's it's just a question of attending to your to your senses and just 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 knowing that you being aware of what you are doing at the time. So it's just self observation is really what it's all about. But the other part of it was the bit that, that Gary got that it's it's remembering to do it. So just the mere fact that you remember to do it is is really the thing that's the most important because what you are doing, the more you practice this, is coming closer and closer to a, a continuous present. So that eventually, you know, these come as little islands, you know, just little islands of light. They are very nice to basically just feel that you're alive and feel that you contacted, you know, with the rest of the world and nature and things like a towel and, you know, just be connected to the physical universe is, is a very nice <laughs> grounding experience. But it just comes in little, little, um, little flashes, and what happens is the more you practice it, you'll get more in extended periods of it. Eventually, it's, it gets to be something, something which they call like every minute then. 
and that's often the aim of Zen is to have just continual wake waking period where you lucid the whole time and aware that you're being aware, a very Buddha like state. But, yeah, people call that Satori and things like that. Hugh, can I can I come in there for a moment? Um, which is the question of uh, a, awakening and this sort of uh, uh, insistence which I think you have that you 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 that it's not a gradual process that you you, you your awakening is not a gradual process um, but then just thinking about what you're saying and I was thinking the same thing about these little islands of, of, of waking up which might gradually become more frequent and longer and then that eventually they all join together into a continent and bingo, it's there all the time. Um, so, I mean, there's a tendency to look at that as gradual awakening or as, I mean, I don't know if it's, it's probably even a waste of time. To no, you think of it like when you're asleep and you're just about to wake up and you have these kind of lucid periods where you're vaguely aware that, you know, the sun's up and then you guys go back to sleep and, and then uh, you you kind of carry on in that that state. If you've ever been in that state where you in bed, you don't have the alarm clock on. It's a Sunday morning, and you're wondering whether you should get up, and you doze back to sleep. And so you're in that kind of phase. But eventually, there comes a point where you actually wake up, and then you don't go back to sleep again. You kind of get out of bed, and that's that's the difference of the continuous period. Is suddenly you wake up so it's not like uh you stitch together a quilt of waking moments and then eventually you've got the complete quilt it's basically each one of those periods will start to have other effects that that i won't mention <laughs> otherwise in my full school and, but with the other uh the other practices combined just especially reflection and you know cogitation on stuff like who is the observer in 1880 and all of those kind of things is, is they all come together in a head with a kind of an explosion. So they are, they more like little earth tremors that are just precipitate an earthquake rather than saying, you know, oh, you'll eventually get to, <laughs> all the little tremors will build up into a huge earthquake that carries on all the time is not quite the right analogy. <laughs> It's that basically they they kind of more like birth pangs, <laughs> and then you eventually get born. So, um, the, yeah. The, oh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say the hard part for me, like you said, is remembering because I I see the value in the exercise of just interrupting, interrupting the routine to be in the present and. I did it one time when I got off the bus. It was dark. I was going home. It's a winter night. But there's a barn uh, that's silhouetted at the bus stop. And I just stopped to look at it. And then, you know, but uh, the hard part is, um, is remembering to do it. But I see the value of, um, you know, it depends on our action, too. I mean, one time you said everything. There are no accidents. There are no coincidences. That's what I gathered. Something about teleology. But but the fact is that we we need to do something to interrupt so that we to interrupt ourselves so that we can see what's going on really because otherwise if we're not going to do it i don't think i can rely on the mercy of someone to interrupt it for me we you need effort right you need to put in effort but it's not really true that you have agency and you're putting in the effort. What's really happening behind the scenes is your alien cortex thinks that it's doing it. So it takes all the credit and says like, I remembered and like, I gave you that little experience with like Gary had with the towel. It's not actually true. It's when it shuts the fuck up, <laughs> then you get that experience. So it's, it, you okay. Have to, yeah. You have to go with it and say, like, well, I good on me. I remembered to do it, but it's horse fodder. <laughs> <product. laughs> it's basically it's you remembering to uh, make your alien cortex forget and waking up the rest of your your brain. 
So why the rest of your brain wakes up is just grace. It's just chance. But the, it's 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 ineffable and it's undescribable. But it's like you might as well ask, why do you wake up in the morning? I don't know. <laughs> you just do. <laughs> yeah. Well. Did I wake myself up? What, was it because of my efforts? Did, you know, if I put enough effort in, you know, like, it's like, who knows? <laughs> no one really knows. Um, it's, it's like, it's like, you know, you might as well ask when I was born. Was that my effort? Did did I have to really kick and shove in my mother's womb until I was born? So, well, yeah. No, who knows? <laughs> I don't know. Do you have an answer for that? No, I was just being silly. I said, yeah, I, I kicked around until I was born. Yeah, it's the strange thing that that's it's in Gazanaga and Sperry's split brain experiments. I mentioned before how they, they actually showed how your alien cortex is confabulating all the time, a story that keeps it in charge of everything. So the remarkable thing that they did was they would give a message to one side of the split brain, like, you know, to one eye. So in other words, they give it to your right eye, which is in other words, your left brain, or your, your uh, left eye, which is your right brain. And they'd say to the like left eye, uh, your, your right brain can, is, is vaguely lingual, uh, lingual. It can actually read a bit. So they can give a written message, or they might perhaps give a message in your ear. The opposite ear is also crossed over. But anyway, they can give a message to one part of your brain, and then they would say something like, go and switch off the lights. And then your your right brain's agreeable, you know, because it's mainly mammalian brain. <laughs> It'll go and, like, switch off the lights. Then immediately they say to the person, like, why did you switch off the lights? Then the left brain answers, and it says, "Oh, I thought it was um, it was getting a bit bright in here. I I just thought it would be better." <laughs> it always makes up a story. It never says, "I don't know." <laughs> it always puts itself in charge and pretends that it made the decision. And we that's an amazing thing because we cannot believe that everything isn't happening because of our agency. But almost nothing's happening because of your agency. There's also another um, very disturbing video. I don't know if I could find it, but th this is very disturbing, especially in our culture, which is individualistic and very, um, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, very egotistical and everything. Everybody thinks they have agency and they determine, you know, they can determine their fate. We, we have this, this uh, as part of our culture. So then, why this video is disturbing is it's because it's of a video of somebody um, in hospital that's lost their short-term memory. <laughs> now, what happens is they have the same conversation over about a minute or, or 30 seconds to a minute. And they've just come out of a coma, so they're talking to their daughter. And their daughter says to them, like, they go, like, how did I get here? <laughs> and they said, oh, mom, you were in a coma. I said, oh, no, why, why was that? And they, they go and they, they say, oh, look at your hair. <laughs> and, they, and then they go over all these sequence events that sounds like a normal conversation till they get to about 30 seconds in and they repeat it identically. So then they go back and they say, oh, how did I get here? <laughs> And the, the daughter then replies, so, and the same thing, like, oh, look at your hair. <laughs> it's like, and when you see that, it's very disturbing because it looks so spontaneous. It looks like they directed, and then you realize all of these things are really on a pre-programmed loop. So this, this, you can see, you can get a glimpse there of how, uh, how we just going through these motions, we basically pre-programmed and uh, we, we're making up the story that we're directing our action. But uh, really, it's, it's way below the alien cortex that all of this stuff happens. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, go yeah, ahead. You're, you're reminding me of my mother. Her short-term memory loss is not anywhere as bad as that. But on a, on a longer 
scale, um, it's around about the same. Yeah, if I ring her up every day, I can absolutely, with perfect safety, have a, have the identical conversation every day, and and it's just perfectly new and fresh, and you know, you just carry on. Um, very much a similar thing. Uh, what I wanted to do is a, a lot of what. Oh yes, what I want to do, if I can just say something, go back a bit about waking up in the morning, and my observation of it sometimes is that you in the process of going from sleep to full wakefulness you pass through various stages of consciousness and one thing that i notice is that has seemed to pass through a non-personal stage of consciousness which i've often wondered is a period of actual awakening and uh the reason for that is there'd be where I live is noisy, and if I'm fully awake, I just find the noise irritating, you know, and I'm aware of it, and I think, fuck these people and their bloody noise and all the rest of it. But for a little while during that waking up period, I'm aware, I'm perfectly aware of all this noise going on and dogs barking and machinery going and cars, but, but there's no judgment of it at all. There's no, um, there's no resistant. None, all of the things that my normal consciousness throws up against that and resists it, it's just not there. It, it's just like it's all going on, and and it's neither fine nor not fine. It, it, it's just, it's just how it is. And and um, I had sort of pondered whether that was a a glimpse into the mind of somebody who was kind of awake yeah. the whole time, you know. Yeah, that's it. It's 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 a kind of divinity. So, what uh, is what really signifies it is is intent and will. So, if you we or our alien cortexes have this general overlay of of desire and aversion, intent, all of this kind of thing. So, this it also comes out as a kind of a dialogue. So. That we're criticizing things that happen that basically throughout the day something will annoy us. Um, we want things to be other than they actually are. So when you really are observing and in the present, your uh, your desires are completely synchronous with what happens anyway. So they, you know, people think, well, hey, when you're enlightened, then does everything just um, you know, all your wishes come true. There's a lot of stuff in the uh, Shruti and Shmriti and the, the the Vedic writings and stuff, kind of how um, wish fulfillment comes true. There's, you know, they talk about the wish fulfilling tree. <laughs> it's kind of like, hey, you you know, you're King Midas. There's a catch to it. And uh, most people think, oh, that's fantastic. You mean I can just think about gold plates and, and uh, getting rich or getting any, any partner that I want. I can get sex from anybody I want. I can, all my desires will be full, fulfilled. And the answer is yes. The catch is that you're speaking out of ignorance. If you actually are in that moment, the only thing you desire is what happens anyway. So all these overlays of desires and things like that that are kind of outside where you are in the moment this kind of alien cortex time machine where it projects forward and i says i want this to happen i want the birds to shut up i want i want the world to be perfect i want i want communism to work I, you know I, we're trying to um make the world conform to our heads but it's far easier <laughs> to make your head conform to the world it's very we've we've gone mad. We've gone absolutely mad because we want you know the mountain to move to Muhammad. We we want the whole world to conform with what's in our little heads. So people go and join XR and they do you know geoengineering and there, there's this continual thing where we've we've wrecked the planet with cars and engineering and the industrial revolution. And what we're trying to do is to make nature conform to what's in our heads. But what we should be teaching kids to do in school is to teach them it's much easier to make your head conform to the world. It's way easier. And that's kind of the definition of sanity. So when you get more into the present, you'll find that 
you are fulfilled. Everything is fulfilled. You have, if you think of something to do now, what people do, they have these kind of um, strange motivations. They think, oh, I'm, I'm, I must clean this. I must do that. I should do that. All these kind of things. And then they like, I'm, I must force myself to go to the gym or something like that. A very strange artificial way of going about things. No, no other primate sits down and thinks, I must cross that river or I must, you know, swing on branches more often. I must do at least 20 pull-ups. on the <laughs> No other ape does that. If they did, they would be dysfunctional. And we are. Basically, we go to the gym and stuff and we think, well, I'm a superman now because I'm getting fit. I'm getting my life together. It's not. You're getting more and more dysfunctional. You can see people. They like they go to the gym. They're completely muscle brown. They're freaks. And they think like, oh, yeah, but I feel good. It's like, no, you're a fucking freak, man. But But they don't see it because they have all these extraneous kind of perverse desires and aversion. And the, the primary desire is that they don't want to die. But you should just say, like, look, it's just easier to die. You know, just like, you don't have to go to the gym. Being like, you know, the biggest hunk on the block doesn't give you eternal life. Just, you can save yourself a lot of money at, at Gold's Gym by just saying, ah, fuck it, I'm going to die. But, you see, that's the primary thing that we're trying to avoid. We can see forward to our death, and then we have all these extraneous things that basically they they annoyances, the irritations, all these kind of things go to make this kind of hair shirt that we kind of live in. But if you get more and more into the present, you're fulfilled in the present because if there's something to be done, like you know, housework or something like that, you don't have to force yourself to do it. The energy to do it is right there as soon as you notice it. It, it only disappears if you don't act on it then for some other reason. Like you say, oh, oh, that's really dirty. I must clean <laughs> that. Anyway, I'll do it after I just check my email. <laughs> You're fucking dysfunctional. You basically, because when you've checked your email, then you, you have to, as an effort of will, drum up energy out of nowhere to actually do the cleaning. But the energy was right there as soon as you saw it. It's just you brought in this extraneous layers of desires and aversions. But if you act spontaneously, like they say, like a Buddha nature, like a dog, a, a dog never does that. A, no other animal does, does what we do. If, if a dog sees a ball, it runs after it. It's effortless. Why? Because it has the adrenaline. Everything is there. As soon as it sees it in its mind, it does it. But what we do is we have this overlay and we have all these second order functions where we just think, well, um, you know, if I run after that ball, people might think I look stupid. You know, <laughs> all this kind of all this, you know, desires and aversions and this, these masks, you know. We, we heard something about Jung and his, um, you know, his archetypes. And then, you know, one, one of them is is the persona. So we have all these personas and things like that that, that are all interfering, they're all these kind of obstacles between us and just the complete, uh, you know, natural and spontaneous interaction with the world. So there's someone um, in habit, which is just a ritual, unthinking um, detachment from the world, which is not it. And there's something where, you know, you're basically being directed, you're trying to force the world into this kind of um, mode that you wanted to operate in just by an effort of will. Um, and then there's this third way, which is you don't desire anything other than is in front of you because it's giving you enough of a buzz to kind of getting high on life. <laughs> so you don't need all the rest. I find what you say um, refers a lot to all our uh, natural impulses. For example, you say, well, as, as a... At, at an animal level of our brain, the need to the feel that you have to clean comes naturally at some time, like a cat who comes in after eating and he starts to lick himself. When well, you feel the moment when your senses, your smell, your touch tell you it's dirty, and I do it, that's when the energy comes out because it's some it's messages that are somatic, that are deeply somatic, that come and say you it's like food. It's like eating. I, 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 for years, would say, what the F are you doing eating and 
regular times. I mean, they all say, ah, oh, people have got weight problems because they don't they eat between meals. But it's not true. It's it's not that. It's because this structure of meals fits the working uh, the working hours and and society. But People are not all hungry at the same time. Look at a baby when he's born. Like you breastfeed a baby, you know. It's, uh, we all have, and then why do we have to have this structure of time to eat breakfast, lunch, dinner? You know, and it's, you know, you're hungry, you eat. Like I don't know. It's just like, but it's again what you say is this control, this 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 kind of complete cut off from your instincts from your natural being yeah the the thing is we we because we don't do things like tasting we eat when we're not hungry and we eat because of say advertising if you see a mcdonald's then you go oh i want a mcdonald's you don't really want a mcdonald's if you actually taste a mcdonald's it tastes like shit i mean it really tastes like shit but nobody knows that because they they just reacting basically uh, leptin is telling them oh you know this it's a high calorie thing over there and so they, you're getting your reptilian brain is telling you you know oh they it fits in with the advertising and then they trigger you to do this uh, what what they call in ethology a fixed action um potential so basically it it's it's just a trigger and a habit if you you break through that if you're actually attending because you're triggered and you think i want a mcdonald's you go and you eat it if you if you don't go mm, oh so good you say it's not really you're not really tasting it you're going oh as a fixed action potential basically it's basically it's you're just going through a fixed behavior that you've taught yourself and mcdonald's has taught you to do if you actually smell it and taste it you go my fucking god this is piece of shit but nobody does that because they're not attending when they actually bite into that burger and then they don't stop they finish the burger. you see everybody will finish the burger because that's what they put in a happy meal or whatever the blasted thing is they give you so you 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 finish it whether you're hungry or not you see like like a chimp wouldn't do that the chimp will leave an apple half finished and stuff, but your mom tells you, well, don't leave that on the plate. So we've divided our, our life up into these slices of meal times, what's on a plate, and then you get this huge wastage, you know, like right now, Xi Jinping is having this, this huge campaign of non-food wastage, which is called the empty plate thing. And it's like, we're not supposed to have food on a plate. <laughs> We're not supposed to sit down and what they say is and you know to preserve food however many people are at a restaurant in china you have you just order one less plate than the number of people it's like this this is not the way we should be eating this is just completely unnatural and then you know you get all these you know supply chain problems and timing problems and it's because we we're chopping up everything into into we're chopping up the quantities into servings on a plate which is fucking daft you know you might not want to eat like that so the fact that we're trying to force our primate sensibilities and behaviors into this very unnatural chrono chronological time slice so we you know a certain time of day we eat we eat for a certain amount of time we eat a certain proportion all of that is completely at odds with our physiology, which is based on Kairos. So we should be able to just go and eat when we want, what we want, and basically uh, it would be local, or it would be in season, it would be something where a chimp could get off a local tree <laughs> in its local environment. And if you did that, you wouldn't get you wouldn't get fat. You wouldn't you you wouldn't um, you would be in peak health. Yeah. But you 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 I would add. If you don't mind, also the experience of the hunger. Um, the you see, if you talk to wait, people, wait, you you you, you got your your mic went. Say that again. Your your mic went. If you ask people, what makes you? What do you feel when you're hungry? What are the the sensations in your mouth, in your stomach, in your head, in your hands that you feel when you're hungry? And it's extremely difficult for people to describe 
what is hunger? Is it a feeling, a pitted feeling in the stomach, saliva in the mouth? Is it, and it is absolutely, if you ask people, how do you know you're hungry? And they just say, I mean, if you look at, at an animal or a, a pet with a little child, you know, you're, Ugh. you know, it's just, uh, they know and actually they put their hands to their belly when they're hungry. Babies who don't talk, you know, they put their hand in the mouth. But humans now don't know what it feels like to be hungry. Except, of course, in extreme situations of hunger and then people experience it in a really terrible way. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we screwed up to oblivion. I mean, it's like water and stuff. They say, you know, they say, oh, you must have eight liters of water. It's, it's pure hooey. That eight liters of water thing has become an icon. And it, it went back to about 2001 when, when Coke brought, brought out Dasani, when they brought out bottled water. They did all this fake research and they just flooded the, all the media with all this crap saying, oh, people are not hydrated enough. It's like, who the fuck ever used the word hydrated before 2001? You can look in Google search. There's no, there's no such word. But in the context of a human being, is hydrated. Then they said, well, exactly. oh, you must be hydrated like a pot plant. You know? Exactly. They did it entirely because as a launch for their fucking bottled water. And now it's still around. You still see people, the importance of hydration. Look, there's an amazing mechanism that basically tells you exactly how much water you need. It's it's a, it's an incredible invention. Nobody's ever heard of it. You you never see it in the press, but it's a very secret mechanism. It's called thirst. <laughs> Major medical breakthrough. They haven't discovered it yet. This is just secret. Just just for us on this video, okay? But it's like the food pyramid that they try to to push on 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 nurses, dietitian, doctors in the nineties and. It was to support the cereal industry because the base of the pyramid was all those carbs, to you know, all those cereals, bread, and all that was at the beginning of the what they call obesity uh, epi epidemic. But it was just, and, and there's still people, I mean, even though I tried to tear them all up in the surgeries where I worked, they were, still they were sent by companies, pharmaceuticals, and there's still people who are handed that out in hospitals. And they've got this ridiculous, like, it's, it's just, you know, you, you, just, you can't do anything. You've got a, a big machine in front of you who is completely brainwashing people to believe in a, in, a, in a food pyramid. And they teach it in school. It, you, you, there's nothing you can yeah. do. That, that, that was actually created by a guy, I can't remember his name, but I, he might have died just recently. He might, might still be alive, but... but the, what what that was was the idea of, of you know Roosevelt's idea of a chicken in every pot. So they were basically trying to feed the whole of America with you know basically this growing population to 320 million. So what they realized the only way to feed this amount of people efficiently, the only way you can have a growing population without having a Malthusian catastrophe is making them eat grains. And so they did the corn subsidy. This was the guy that did the corn subsidy. The corn subsidy, it was, was a disaster for American health. It's basically caused in the pandemic of diabetes. It did kind of do the, it did actually feed America, but it fed America on starch. It's basically, you, you if you put starch in your mouth, it turns to sugar almost immediately. So you're putting your body effectively into toxic shock. You actually talking about a McDonald's now that we're on it and nutrition. <laughs> you can actually taste it in your mouth. If you next time you have a burger or something like that, especially from McDonald's, which is just high fructose corn syrup, <laughs> basically just food substitutes. Uh, you can actually taste in your mouth that, that you can taste the sugar and you can taste what it's what it's doing. And if you if you actually attend very closely and taste your food and just attend to your body while you eat it, you can you can tell that it's not doing you a lot of good. That we 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 chimps. We, if you look what a chimp and a gorilla eat, they're basically in a big salad bowl eating fruits and berries and very wide diversity of things. Um, but nothing like starch. Starch uh, was was a uh, 
it was a bad accident. And from what I can tell, the start starts was it's not like the story that they tell kids in school. What came first was was beer and it was used as an entheogen. What they're using it is in religious practices to get alter, altered states of mind. So they use it, but what they were doing was they're getting ergot, basically LSD and stuff is from rye and ergot and stuff. So at places like Gebekli Tepe, they, there's evidence that they're using beer, but they, they're not using beer like, it's not the same kind of beer as you go and chug down at the local. <laughs> It's an infusion of a lot of things, but clearly the, what they're doing is they're using it as an entheogen and uh, to get these religious states of mind. And that comes first. They domesticated wheat to serve the church. It's it's like it's not like communion wine, um, you know. But it's not like oh we had grapes and wine and then that turned into the Eucharist and the communion wine. It's not like that at all. The communion wine came first. They were looking for drugs and stuff to make altered states of mind. And then we we, we got wine uh, and we, we started cultivating wine and other fruits and stuff to serve that religious purpose. So it's exactly the other way around. But the evidence is all, is all there. If you look at the Dionysian rites, the Eloisian mysteries and stuff, what, they, what they're doing is they, they're using... Um, hallucinogens <laughs> and uh, wine is one of them beer was one of them but they made a, a, a kind of witch's brew with you know all these mandrake and deadly nightshade and stuff they're making a potion that sends you off your rock <laughs> for religious purposes and that that's where we got the grain from to serve those religious things then we started domesticating wheats and stuff around around Gebekli Tepe in those areas. And eventually, uh, you know, just like gurus enslave people in cults, cities enslaved large numbers of slaves, made people slaves to the religious ceremonies. So religion comes first and people are indoctrinated into cults that then become basically uh, labor camps. It, 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 if you doubt what I have, go back to Germany and see what happened in the 1930s. You start with this idea, this religious cult, and then basically everything is to serve that cult. Everything then becomes, uh, that leads, and then everybody is drawn in, and then eventually you get into the labor camps, and then they recapitulate exactly what happened to us with civilization. Civilization is fucking evil. <laughs> But you can't convince people of that these days because one of the reasons is that they're not attending. They're, they're, in, this, they're in this kind of trance and uh, you know the media and advertising and stuff needs it to be that way. We, we, if, if everybody lived like a chimp and ate fruit and salad, America couldn't feed itself. And Britain, fuck. Britain, so, how many people could live in Britain? So 5,000, not even 1,000, I wouldn't say. So the food pyramid, hydration, all this crap, that's conspiracy theory. So. <laughs> I know, but I mean, I mean it, is, go, it is, it is, because and, it, and people believe in it. But, but go back to Egypt, and yeah. you see loads of stones, and what are they feeding them on? Yeah, and wheat. That's what, basically, that's how they kept them going on the pyramids. And yeah, it's like... Yeah. That was their food pyramid. And you say, well, why why didn't they feed them healthy shit? Because they, they were they were chronically undernourished. All the guys that built the pyramids are chronically undernourished. They're short stature, short lives. <laughs> they're thinking it's a nutritional disaster. And say, well, it's it's cheap food. Your starch is cheap food. Basically, that's what that's what happened. If you go to South Africa, see the evolution of South Africa. It started with maize. The reason was maize is very cheap food for a slave. It's cheap sugary food for a slave. It's cheap energy. It's the cheapest form of energy you can get on a store, and and that's why we that's why we have it. But I think we I think we mentioned this before, but it is worth going over, especially in the context of tasting your food, and in the context of of not being hypnotized by, by uh, advertising. So. If if you walk down the street, look at a Coke ad, or look look at the look at the the outside of a McDonald's, they've they've got red, um, the red and the yellow. Uh, they were they were market tested 
to make, to trigger your reptilian brain. They have lots of people inside. It's all kind of crowded and it's like a feeding frenzy. That feeds right into your reptilian brain. It's like a, your reptilian brain says, oh, there's a feeding frenzy going on on the African plane. I must get involved in that. Um, and yeah, they're basically, they, they've got us uh, completely hooked. Um, hooked that way. But anyway, yeah. Was um, just just briefly, Hugh, um, I can't remember the details, but quite a few years ago, I listened to a fellow giving a series of lectures, and he was uh, talking about how in times gone past, looking at uh, ancient accounts of heroes and great deeds of physical endurance and all the rest of it, that in the texts he was finding the use of the word pulse, P-U-L-S-E, and um, he was working on this theory that that uh, uh, a lot of their physical capacity, which people don't seem to have now, was related to the fact that their diet was significantly better. And he was sort of going into the research of, well, what, what was it that these people were actually eating? Um, and, uh, you know, whereas these days pulse means more or less grains, um, they're, they're, they're apparently, you know, the, the, perhaps a, the biblical intention was that they were uh, eating a more natural diet um, than, uh, than what people are now. I, I just mentioned that in case it means anything to you. I can't quite recall yeah, not, much I'm detail. Sure, I'm not sure of Pulse, um, the, but what they were eating was a lot more diversity. So they, they, they ate a wide diversity of things. Um, our diets are, are very narrow now. Um, you know, you think, oh, well, come on, there's loads of shit in the supermarket. They're not really. If you look at nutritionally, they all kind of come from, like you're saying, like from the food pyramid. But, you know, they, they in times past, they ate genuinely weird shit, you know, from completely, <laughs> you know, from shrews to robins and you know crickets and <laughs> um snails and stuff which you know you in, in france they still have quite a, a broad um uh, palette but um in america it's if you look at the ingredients they're extraordinary thin and 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 the the species as well just they estimate that the just joining the EU, just formulating the EU, I think there was something like 3,000 grains went extinct, 3,000 types of grains. And the reason is the EU just classified, you know, the marketable types of grains into like 300 varieties or something. So, so we lost thousands of varieties just by shoehorning everything into a short list of, you know, known types. And so... If you look at the known types of foodstuffs in a, in Vons or Ralphs or whatever in America, it's it's, it's coming from a very very narrow um, variety of, of food sources, and that that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is is if, if people would be healthy if they just got a whole load of junk, you'd be better off, you know, eating out of a garbage tip and just getting a complete cross-section of stuff your body would get what it needed out of it um, there, are, there are people across europe and particularly i know a group here called seed savers and these people started at the time you at the time when there was the threat to have a lot of our vegetables and should vegetables and seeds disappear to keep them and propagate them and cultivate them so that they open pollinated and can be saved and there's Germany, France, I don't know about England, but I know Italy, Portugal, and Ireland. I've got a lot of those um, things that are sometimes grow in the wild, and that were perennials, but sometimes cultivated from the Middle Ages and before, still available. They, and actually, if you look at their gardens, you, you see that there's an enormous variety of, even in cabbages or leeks or anything, you've got... 15 sorts of different different things that you there's nothing to do with the supermarket vegetable that you you choose so among a species you have diversity already not only you know it so it is a 
though it's not completely bleak in terms of some people have kept a lot a lot of those of those seeds but uh, yeah well well the other thing is seasonality so certainly in the northern latitudes and temperate climates um, seasonality of foods is important we don't have seasonality anymore you can like get strawberries in the middle of winter and it's flown from around the world that that's not good for you that's uh, you the you know there's certain times of the year where you need things we we, we have evolved to, to have you know we haven't evolved entirely in the tropics we we have evolved some kind of seasonality so you you need you need to have things um, and ch you know that change over at least the period of a season but now you know you get the same 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 menu year in year out that's not good for you um, I'm just thinking, you just reminded me of something that, uh, um, you know, with the migration of humans into Europe and eventually to very northern, like the Scandinavian countries and that, where, um, you know, most of their diet must have been meat because they were, the, the quality of the natural vegetation was probably not enough to sustain humans. And um, I'm just sort of wondering whether, you know, um, then later on in, in human history, going back and starting to feed those people, those blonde-haired, blue-eyed people who are adapted to eating meat for most of their diet, and then, and then they're coming back and starting to eat grains and getting health problems and that kind of thing um that you know there's there's probably a consideration there as well in terms of the adaptation that their bodies have made over a period of time yeah this is something that gets torsten upset is like people talk about vegetarianism and stuff and he's up in North, northern greenland he's like you can't be vegetarian up there. <laughs> Basically, it's meat or nothing. <laughs> so the you know vegetarians don't like that. Uh, you know the, this this bullshit that you know we can just eat if we all turn vegetarian, then we save the planet. <laughs> it's like that was a bullshit. But the um, the I think the Neanderthals and, and white people really are um, half Neanderthal. I think that that the Neanderthals were serious meat eaters. They well, they ate a lot of things like snails and stuff like that. But there's also enough evidence that they were cannibals too. <laughs> That's the most healthy and and easily digested food you can can eat is something from your fellow human being. <laughs> so they they I think that that might have been the reason why we wiped them out. Uh, we. Crow Magnus probably didn't like them because of uh, because of cannibalism, but you see it going all the way through. And with the Romans, uh, the Romans wiped out a lot of people in Ireland. They wiped out the Picts and stuff, I think. And the reason was because the Druids they were repulsed. The uh, Romans didn't mind much, you know. They they were pretty debauched. But one thing that really got under their skin was cannibalism. Romans had this real thing about cannibalism. They didn't like it. And um, yeah, they they. There's accounts of them killing druids and stuff because they didn't like the cannibalistic rituals. But I think the, the druids are the remnants of Neanderthals, you know, the Celtic types and stuff. Even in Russia, too, the, there's this kind of strong folk memory of of cannibalism. And, um, yeah, it's, it's like a famine barely has to start in Russia and they're all tucking into each other. <laughs> you, you, know, you know that there's, there's a more than... Um, you know, just the folk memory going on there. It's kind of inbred, I think. That brings me to think <laughs> that one of the topics that we had, uh, that you had, uh, uh, Hugh, offered was to talk about the archetypes. I know this might be a transition, but I, I am very ignorant in cardio. I've learned a bit generally about it. And I think uh, uh, we talk about unconscious, we talk about archetypes, we talk about shadow these terms that come in the conversation a lot and i i would be really grateful if we could have a bit of of or maybe not now because we're talking about diet and stuff but when you thought when you started to put in my mind the 
the idea of cannibalism, the old ideas, those all, it, it's just suddenly the word archetype came and, and I associated it with the topic of today. I don't know if well, any- Well, it is one of the topics, so we should talk about it. So no, I don't know what the group says. It's a good segue, the cannibalistic archetype, the white <laughs> man. The shadow, yeah, so what I think about um, Jungian archetypes is I think Jung and Freud to a certain extent, they were, they were really kind of idiosyncratic about their theories. They were, a lar large part of them were cultural. They, they emphasized a lot of more culture than they should have. But I think if you look at the Jungian archetypes, it, what, what he's doing is he's really observing the, the layered brain. And so, you know, what he calls the, the conscious is the alien cortex, the, the id and the ego, um, the self is, is the alien cortex. And then the shadow is all the other four layers. You know, it's like the alien cortex can tell, oh, there's a hell of a lot going on underneath the, <laughs> under the covers. And so that's, that's what the, the shadow is. You, you can see uh, they kind of, pick out all these things which are clearly, in my view, you better off saying they're part of the layered brain. So for example, if you look at things like the persona, persona, he's clearly looking, he's, he's getting glimpses of the primate. Because it's only, you know, primates are the first uh, evolutionary stage that we got to the way people would actually give a false front. In other words, you know, if you, if, uh, ethologists like Franz Duval, he writes about things about how dealing with chimpanzees and stuff that they will fake fake you out. They will give false impressions. They will actually wear a mask. One of the things he he mentioned was that there was um, a one of the chimps in 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 the facility where what that's a zoo uh, or lab, and then he he that chimp would like squirting water. At, at people and at, at human beings too. And so uh, he said, you know, he could see that the chimp had a mouthful of water. And he, he said, I can see you. I know you've got a mouthful of water. And then the chimp swallowed it and went, ha, ha, you know, like, oh, got me. <laughs> and he, that's very much that kind of social uh, interaction of actually, you know, getting fun out of that mischievous. So Jung also talks about the trickster and stuff like that. What he's looking at is the, the primate brain, that kind of getting getting joy. Monkeys like teasing each other and stuff, and it's a kind of uh, social game of one-upmanship and stuff. They get a huge buzz out of it as social animals. And and so you can clearly see that's what he's talking about. Is is a, it's, it's our primate brain. I mean, when we were shrews or you know, little mammals, we uh, we didn't have any use for that. There's not a lot of use for hamsters and stuff to put on false expressions and to try and fake people out or to tease each other and stuff. They just didn't have the need in that uh, in that environment. So you can, s I think it's way better to see it as an evolutionary layer and then it all comes out and then it's not cultural and it's not idiosyncratic. But yeah, Jungian archetypes, if you look at things like the old man is one of his archetypes, the, the Senex, and that old man is, is, is clearly your alien cortex. And then the, the child or the little girl, and you know, that, you know, he's seeing the mammalian brain, you know, each one of these things. And then eventually they get to modern psychology and they have the big five personality types, which as far as I can tell, were just sucked out of their ass. But they, they, they just took five personality types and then just completely random as far as I can tell. And then they, they said, oh, well, you know, they're valid because statistically speaking, they're non-overlapping. It's like, really, that's its pedigree? <laughs> it's like, come on, this is pathetic. In the, in the annals of human understanding, we, we haven't got as, we've never got so low as the five personality types. But the, the five personality types also, you can see the, the layered brain model, you can see like, you know, agreeableness, women high, score very highly on agreeableness. Why? Because it's the mammalian brain. They're just looking at the mammalian brains. Each one of these things, you know, conscientious, oh, it's an alien cortex. You, know. you, can, you can clearly see 
that they've seen the, the five evolutionary layers and it's just better to just just call them call them that but that 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 um leads into that other exercise of observing those layers in in the moment and it's it, it's a very good day when you can see a mcdonald's and and see like oh i feel like a burger and then you you don't change it you don't try and suppress it but you you say wow that's my you know if people had that language if we change if we had it as part of our culture to say oh my my uh, my reptilian brain feels like a burger that that would be a quite a completely different society and a much more enlightened society so for example in wokeism and stuff like that you wouldn't say like you know oh you're prejudiced you say like oh you know you've got a very strong reptilian response to the other <laughs> That's far more enlightened than saying you're a fucking racist. <laughs> it's like, where do you go with you're a fucking racist? The, the, you see, the mere fact that they say something like you're a fucking racist is that word fuck is, is a straight appeal, a direct appeal to the reptilian brain. The word fuck is a, a motive trigger word for the reptilian brain. That's one of its four functions, four Fs, you know? And so, so basically the word fuck is just like, you know the reason why you don't say fuck in polite society is because polite society is your primate brain social hierarchy and your your alien cortex which wants everything sanitized it wants control and it's kind of like doesn't like the reptilian part of your brain getting uppity so your your alien cortex is suppressing all the lower layers that's where jung and freud gets to this idea that we have the conscious and unconscious and they in conflict with each other. It's really kind of Viennese society and Viennese Vienna of their time is pure alien cortex. So they, they taking that and saying, well, you know, there's a lot of rumbling going on down in the other layers. There's a reptilian brain and stuff. And then in Viennese society, quash that basically, you must, must not be a reptile, you know, keep, keep your tail, in your um, in your monkey suit, you know, basically you're, it's all coat and tails and black and white, you know. Look at all the squares and stuff. <laughs> you know, it's you know, representations, symbolism, all these things, substitution, inversion, all the things you can see of the alien cortex. Vienna was alien cortex city, and so you know they don't like this unruly reptile coming, you know, and upsetting that um, kind of. Uh, rarefied atmosphere so yeah so then that's where freud says you know we have we have these instincts of uh, you know very the shadow the base instincts it's just saying yeah we've got a reptilian brain who ha <laughs> well, it's not a great discovery <laughs> it's kind of obvious but but then you see how um, how then uh, how important languages and stuff for triggering bits parts of these brain uh, parts of the brain so it, it would be a very good thing is if you got to the point where you're observing you're doing the exercise of observing which part of the five layered brain is being triggered by stuff so if you i mean go this far if you walked into a viennese ball go through this thought exercise you here's a viennese ball everybody it's it's like the sound of music and there's the van trap family they all arranged nicely from you know highest to lowest who does that alien cortex of course it's all arranged and but it's also a hierarchy so got a bit of primate brain there so you you walk into the dance floor it's square okay it's geometric it's black and white it's checkered tiles you know that's what the dance floor is going to be so you know black and white there's monotone the tiles you know this is alien cortex it's um it's it's music and and language and stuff like that so you know it's all highbrow it's it's alien cortex and so if you if you look at a scene like that and just just observe saying that's the primate brain. That's and then say, oh, this person is putting on a mask. They've got a false persona. Well, they're doing that for, you know, one-upmanship on the primate brain, and it, it's 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 golden to see that in other people. But if you can see it in yourself, then that's a real victory. But just imagine how different our world would be, is if if people, you know, didn't you use a motive. Um, 
categories like left and left wing and right wing and con, you know conservative and liberal and stuff and, and just say yeah you you know you your money say i have instead of saying you know we must be compassionate and loving is is it would be much better if our culture said i have a very hyperactive mammalian brain because you see as the minute you say that you've, you've objectivized it and neutralized it so it it doesn't have any, any more power yeah. than that. Hugh, and can i interrupt oh, sorry but a, a lot of the sarcasm and parody and that that come out in some of the comments that, that you make and uh, on Reddit and that, I think is an acknowledgement of that by restating the thing another way to, to wake people out of the conventional way of expressing a situation. Yeah, um, I just can't think of anything. What I'm usually doing is using the mirror. So basically, yeah. if people are all mad, they will fucking bark in psychotic mad. So and and dangerous, vaguely dangerous too. So so what I'm I'm doing is is mirroring back so that they can see themselves. It's exactly what you're doing yourself with this exercise. So this exercise is an exercise of self observation. Well, all the ones I've given you are really exercise in self observation. So because these people are not self observant. And we, are, we don't teach our children to, uh, we don't educate in schools for self-observation, just, just basically um, self-aggrandization and stuff like that. The self-esteem movement is, is, is really uh, bolsters um, uh, really egotism. So, but this is the opposite. This undermines egotism. And, uh, and since people are not, trained to have any self-awareness, I'm doing them the favor of presenting their bullshit back to them in the mirror. So in, that's in general what I'm doing. A lot of the time, just 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 aggravating people. And, and also trying to just weed them out because they're, they're, you know, a lot of people are getting entertainment out of this and that's that's going nowhere. Yeah, if, if you, if, if you want to be on a journey of self-improvement and, and you're just out for a bit of entertainment, you can fuck right off because it's it's utterly counterproductive to, to you and to everybody else. This is hard work and it's painful. So basically, uh, I, I go out of my way to try and, you know, I don't, I don't really ban people in this. They're just hostile and try. They, they have been, I think, I banned two people on ExxonMed and it, they were, they were, actively just trolling to destroy the, the whole thing. So then I just, I, those are obvious things that they're just trying to shut down free speech in fact. But, but the, in, in general, the, you know, the other types are just are guys who don't get the program, <laughs> like people who have been on this a little while and they just come in cold and they think it's just entertainment and stuff. And then, then I will try to give them a run around and try and uh, reflect them back. But if if they turn out to get get a kick out of it and think this is kind of sport, then I'll get I'll get harsh and harsh and try try to get them off to just just fuck off and get the entertainment somewhere else. And the the reason is that you a group like this is uh, it basically it all comes from you know. Uh, what what we're doing is really a cult. I mean, there's no way, there's no denying it. But the the where it comes from is is uh, my training in cults and stuff, and and uh, what Gurdjieff said. So like, uh, what what Gurdjieff said, and this is stinking true, is that there's only so much gold leaf. He called it like gold leaf to go around. He says that that. that that in any time we are talking about where this memory comes from, where you know efforts comes from, and say it's just grace. Well, that grace, good you've called like gold leaf. So he said that basically you get these people that are born from time to time just by accident that have higher levels of awareness and and more enlightened type of beings. If no one knows why, it's just part of the universe's game. And then he says, but, but they only have so much to give. They can only take a small group of people so far. And, and you kind of run out of substance. So uh, it can be diluted. You can have 
uh, you know, it's kind of it's kind of like an Alexa that you can spread them, you know, a, a one drop. You can do like Eckhart Tolle, you know, he, he's doing like one drop amongst thousands and thousands of people. So he spreads very, very thin. He spreads his kind of, uh, his light very, very thin. Uh, the good of way is to be more intense with a few number of people. Um, and so that's the tradition I was, I was uh, educated in. So the, the, so the idea is you can't have too many time wasters and bullshit <laughs> artists. You're better off having some people that actually know what's, have some inclination of what's going on and want to actually improve and get somewhere. And in that case, you have to weed out, you have to do do a bit of, uh, you know, chucking out. <laughs> um, because people will come with all sorts of motives. Um, and um, yeah, for a lot of people, they, they're just fucking around, you know. But I, I take this kind of seriously. And I think that, you know, you if, if, uh, if it is as I think it is, and we're all heading for collapse, you, you want to make the most out of um, the time that's left. And the, the, the best use that I can think of for the time that's left is, is enlightenment. It's getting the full money's worth for the, <laughs> the journey. You know, it's kind of like we didn't ask to go on this ride, but now that we're on it, we want to get our full money's worth right. And so the way to get it is with these kind of exercises and stuff. Um, uh, the, the way not to do it is to is to suck other people's essence. So a large part of our culture and what we're doing is is we're in a game of you know vampirism, and so we have all these people that are you know they've set up a monetary system to suck our our lifeblood, our energy, our our essence. In in effect, that's what capitalism is doing. What these guys like. Uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos is they're vampires. They're just they're sucking, they're literally sucking your energy and attention, your lifeblood. There, there are thousands and thousands of employees in Amazon that that have have been reduced to robots just so that you know Jeff Bezos can accumulate wealth. And so you you can take what I think that's why Gurdjieff called it gold leaf because it does really translate into money in our society because. You have to put in creative attention and uh, effort to actually accumulate money, and these people have unearned money. They're taking they're taking it off people that are put into the system by work. I mean, by work, I mean very broadly. I mean, their intent work is really uh, stuff going on in your head, and it's not just muscular work. It's it's imagination, it's enlightenment, it's um, it's a lot of verbal energy. There's a tremendous amount of, of energy that goes into a dollar. And uh, they're taking it. They're taking it. That's how they steal it. They, they, they have unearned income in the system that they've set up. So that is the conspiracy <laughs> that's, that's going on. Um, but what it means is that, that uh, to break away from that, uh, you you need a, a breakaway group like this, and the way the way to free a slave is is enlightenment. So the first step is to you know um, see themselves and see the plantation for for what it is, and then that's that's the whole thing. I mean, what what else would you want as as uh, in in the time before collapse? What else do you want as a slave other than freedom? I mean, the plantation is going to burn down. The, it's the least you could have, right? Yeah, for sure. Oh, uh, can I ask you a quick question about the layered brain exercise? So I didn't quite do it yet, but I was thinking about it, you know, like running, you know, in my head, uh, what it would be like. So you, you acknowledge the uh, other four layers, the shadow, you know, and what I was thinking was like, um, so you know how that one time you were talking about how on the internet people are watching like cute fuzzy animal videos and triggering the main brain. So like you step back and you see the alien cortex, you know, running, you know, like a narrative or whatever, like trigger um, the other layers out of nowhere. So is, is that what we're trying to neutralize there? Stepping back and be like, hey, why are you doing that to the layered brain? You're lying. <laughs> 
it's not so much to suppress it or change it. Don't try and change anything. Just just observe it. It will change. It, you can't help uh, bringing it out into the light and seeing a change. But you don't want to try and force some result. It, it's good to see, you know, just go through and interpret the world around you in those ways. So, in other words, if you walk down the street, you kind of do it with, um, you know, your I live glasses on. And you look at adverts and you say, what's that advert trying to stimulate? If you, if you know how advertisers work, you can see, oh, they're trying to do blue. They're trying to invoke, you know, a lot of banks and stuff. They often have blue as a color. And they, that's because research shows that that's a color that engenders trust. And then you say, okay, they're trying to get your mammalian brain. Then they'll, they'll do something like you'll see an ad for, say, a car. And then the car is like, it, it's a, it's a, generally a car would be an appeal to your reptilian brain. They often make uh, cars, you know, black and um, they tint the windows because your alien, your, your reptilian brain, uh, it seems that in our evolutionary history, the eye was very important to dinosaurs and lizard brain and stuff. It's kind of like when the Tiktaalik crawled out of the, the primordial seas onto land, it was suddenly got high visual acuity because, you know, it was could see in air. There's a lot, the water's more turbid and it's you don't have high visibility that often and longer range in water and it's darker. So when we seem to have crawled out onto land, the eye seemed to have become inordinately important in the long range eye. So it seems to have been built in at that layer uh, of the reptilian brain. And also, we had a light spot, you know, basically the pineal gland it is today. But it, that is part, part and parcel. Of, amphibians use that as a light director. So, the, so light and the eye and stuff is very important for the reptilian brain. So when you look at a car, then you'll see they'll have tinted windows, windows because Ambush is also an important thing for, like, it seems like um, a lot of the, what dinosaurs were doing to each other were jumping on each other and they were ambushing each other. So you, you see cops, if you walk down the street, you'll see cops. The cops are working from the reptilian brain. A lot of what they do, a lot of people join a police force because they, um, they are addicted to adrenaline. They're basically, it's pure reptilian brain shit. Uh, what they don't know is they reveal all their psychology in these kind of archetypal ways. And one of them is they have shades, you know, cops love, you know, especially reflective sunglasses. That, because that's a reptilian thing is you can't see what I'm looking at. I can get the jump on you. You know, it's a power trip and it's pure reptilian brain. Then oh, yeah. Look, look at Riot Police. They all dress like the Ninja Turtles. They have a fucking armor. And, they, and you say, and what do they drive around in? It's, it's a, I mean, some some armored vehicles are called turtles. <laughs> it's like you can't it up. But they they love the green and the black. The boot, right? The Nazi boot is is uh, is is basically trying to hide the mammalian, mammalian foot because our foot is very primate, right? So you you there's nothing that sucks more for your you know reptilian brain to have you know. Uh, uh, for, you know those kind of shoes? I can't remember what they're called. Drugs or whatever? No. They, they kind of had, they're, they're repulsive neoprene things that make your toes stand out. What they, they like have, you know those things? I can't remember what they're called. Yeah. yeah. In, in essence, if you see somebody wearing them, they look ridiculous. They look like monkey feet. <laughs> and, and so that, they're triggering your, your you know, you know, as a marketer, you could you could have told those guys, look, this is never going to go anywhere as a shoe because the shoes, you don't want, nobody wants to have a foot that appeals to your primate brain. <laughs> well, you want to cover you up that, that foot and then like a boot. And then it's like, you know, like if you have a, like jack boots and Nazis and stuff, they, they're trying to appeal to power and intimidate and basically they, they territorial. They're trying to appeal to your reptilian brain. So they have a boot on and stuff, and it basically covers the primate foot. <laughs> and, and so they, they all, as you walk down the street, you, it's very useful to see, okay, you straight up, you can look a guy up and down and say, this guy, he wants to be a fucking 
T-Rex, you know, he's like, <laughs> and then you know, you, you know, okay, he's straight from there. And then as you get better in this, you know how to deal with people at that level. You can, you you know, you can appeal to, to him, you know, that it's all about flight and flight and sex and territoriality and stuff. And so, so in those situations, I mean, I had one just the other day, I had to go to the police station <laughs> over here and they, they all have, have reptilian brains. And then, uh, um the the guy was hostile to me and it was basically territorial thing yeah everybody knows i'm in greece so anyway he got hostile saying like why are you in greece why you know <laughs> like this and i said ah oh, blah 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 you know alien cortex answer and then then he said he he said it again like really harsh like why are you in greece you know like like fuck off you foreigner he's he's behind the desk of the police desk it's a very intimidating thing but but instantly, like because he's from the you know the reptilian brain, then it's all about ter territorial territoriality, us and them and stuff. I don't speak Greek, but but the best I could do was saying, Greece is the best country in the world. Why wouldn't I want to be in Greece? <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly he went like, oh, this guy's okay. <laughs> 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 what, about, what about smell? Um, I, I had that question. The the strong um, sense of smell in the yes. brain, in the layered brain. Yes, you must it's be kind of that. confusing where it would, you know. Yes, you must be very careful of smell. Smell is in the fish brain, um, and uh, yeah, this is this is territory which is not politically correct. A lot of what signals the other is smell, right? It's pheromones. You see, a lot of um, this was something that came up in South Africa when they did truth and reconciliation. They they had to integrate the two armies that were fighting each other, <laughs> and so they had to do training on, you know, reconciling uh, races that have been completely segregated, right? And more than segregated, fighting each other in the bush. So then they had to, you, you, you kind of, it's like fighting the Nazis one day, then suddenly all is forgiven. And then you have to, you know, the SS unit is going to be put in your allied unit. You have to work with them. And it's like, fuck, this is not easy. One of the things they told them in the training was they knew what they were talking about. And they said, what the research shows is smell is very, very important. Now it came for a big revelation for whites and blacks. To, they both thought that they were the only ones that thought the other ones smelled. <laughs> so white people always thought that Africans smelled because they they have this like rich, fruity kind of smell, but that that's um, you know just associated with, with white people, just associated with Africans in Africa. You don't really want to talk about this stuff because it's completely politically incorrect. Both sides were shocked during this training. To find out that they weren't the only ones that thought the other side smelled. So white people were shocked to discover. White people thought, well, if you ask white people, well, we don't smell. <laughs> oh, yes, we do. <laughs> and they're like, really? What do we smell of? And the black people said, you smell like death. And I went, what the fuck? <laughs> what do you mean we smell like death? <laughs> we smell nice. We smell perfumed. And they said, that's the smell of death. And so, so basically, each each realized what that basically things like that are really important in terms of smell. But you see, once you know that, you've elevated both sides have then elevated it to the alien cortex. So then, they basically, it's not like you know the other races start start to smell differently. A lot, a lot of the time, it's it's. It's below your level of consciousness. Usually, it's below your level of consciousness. But those pheromones and that, it's all going on in Jung's shadow. Basically, your you, why all wokeism and stuff is just stupid is because it's just in the alien cortex and it's suppressing the other layers. But the other layers, they don't suppress that way. You can't say, you know, oh, you know, you, you it's only, you know. Race is only skin deep. It's a race is a, is a social construct. That's the bullshit the left tells themselves. It's like, it's no, it's not. It's a biological construct. And say, oh, no, it was invented in the 17th century. Was one person was telling me that that's like complete crap. 
but but what uh, the science shows is that if they do the, what's called the T-shirt test, they can do a smell test, and it has different results. And basically, um, you know, it, uh, for for women, it depends on what time in estrus it is and stuff. And so 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 for men, it's quite completely different. A woman. Um, what women are trying to do in general as a, what they call a sexual strategy or reproductive strategy is they're trying to get as much variation as possible. So from the point of view of like a disease model, they assume it's much better for you to actually uh, have kids with somebody who's very genetically distant from you. That's probably the most robust, uh, the most robust way. Now, that's kind of fish brainy, reptilian brain stuff. If you get a bit higher, then it's in complete conflict with, uh, say, the reptilian brain's um, territoriality and in-group, out-group effect. In the, the mammalian brain, oxytocin, also has an in-group and out-group effect. Right? And uh, by the time you get to the primate level brain, it's it's all about you know who you are, where you are, and the stay you know in the hierarchy, whether you're uh, part of the tribe or outside the tribe, and so each one of these things interprets as so we, we're completely dysfunctional, pretending that we're all in the alien cortex and we're all debating this stuff online as if we're um, intellectualizing all the stuff. Meanwhile, there's a completely different conversation going on in each one of these different layers. The, the primate brain is screaming at you that, you know, this is a different race. You know, this is going to rape my daughter. <laughs> and it's like, we have to say, shut up, shut up, shut up. And that's why we have cancel culture. It's, it's the alien cortex saying, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up. And, and basically everybody's under a fucking pressure cooker. So that's what Jung and Freud found. They found that all these layers were with odds with each other. So the net effect is a huge drain, a huge drain on, in terms of psyche and energy, and it only gets worse. Basically, this kind of gender pronoun thing and stuff, it means you have to work hard all the time to think of the correct gender pronoun. It's completely artificial, and it takes work. So we, 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 uh, we're kind of neurotic in the Freudian sense because we're working against ourselves. We, when we came in on the thing, I said, you know, if you see something, uh, and you're spontaneous about it, like, see, there's a dirty sink, and, you know, instantly you think, oh, I must, that, that needs to be clean. You have the energy to do it straight away. But if you had cross purposes, then you, you, um, you have no energy, because one side is defeating the other. It's kind of like um, the opposites are working against each other, and that's, that's what we're doing in, internally. And wokeism puts an extra layer of that. You're saying, is that, like, you, you must, you must, work harder to suppress those other layers. And so it's it's completely in the alien cortex. And it's it's saying like, I don't care how much stress you have as a, as a working slave. Here's some more stress. You've got to double down on your alien court, uh, on your reptilian brain and what it's trying to tell you. And it's trying to tell you stuff like, this is bad mojo. This is, this, this, this uh, reptile smells differently. Then the primate brain is trying to say this is an out group and this is you know different in the hierarchy and and there's this I mean, civil war going on in people's heads in terms of the layered brain and then you've got to put a lid on that. And so like, why do you think it explodes? Why do you think we have a capital riot? It's it's literally the other reptilian. It's it's the other layers of the brain exploding. And so you can't get just put them in a pressure cooker and shove a lid on it. So wokeism is no, is coming from the alien cortex, no understanding of human psychology, and uh, then you've got this left wing stuff, which is just complete nonsense about how gender is a social construct and just just horseshit, endless horseshit. Race was in you know was a concept invented by colonialists in the 17th century. Oh fuck! I, I, I can rattle these all for you. They're just complete horseshit that comes from the alien cortex. Thank and, you so much for that. That's so clear. Thank you, really. Thank you very much. Yeah. So so anyway, it's it's no wonder there's there's tension in in these things. But yeah, if you go back to civil rights movement and that, it's very hard. To explain it to kids because it doesn't make any sense. It's like, well, black and white people were segregated, 
And then Martin Luther King came along and said, I have a dream that this is stupid and we shouldn't be doing this shit. And now nobody does that anymore. And what the fuck were those people thinking? And it's like, no. <coughs> You're just completely pretending that it's all in. It's just completely pretending that it's all in the alien cortex. If you want to understand the civil rights, the civil rights were, movement was happening round about the reptilian brain. So you, to even begin to understand the north-south divide or the politics of you know racism or slavery, you've got to understand the, the reptilian brain and the, the whole thing that was going on there. So we, we haven't got a hope because we, we, <laughs> we, we don't understand ourselves. The tools are not, not there. But but self observation and these <clears throat> these things that I'm explaining to you are, are a way to get there. So nothing changes. You see, you see, everybody thinks that the world should be other than it is, and that's probably not a good point <laughs> to come in on. So this idealism comes from the alien cortex, and so people just can't get it. The re we're going extinct because of this. Because we think the world has to be something other than it is. It's like, if I like to play with people and stuff, and they, they say, you know, well, that's, you know, that's horrible because it's racist. I'm like, really? Why shouldn't you be racist? And I go, um, <laughs> I'm not really sure. I was told it was wrong, but I can't remember why. Now. I mean, well, you know, it's just, it's just horrible. Then people just don't get on and there's violence. What's wrong with violence? It's not nice. <laughs> what is, what in you is making you think that things should be nice? So people people think that everything should be other than it is. You know, I'll just tell you one small anecdote here. Is, is I uh, when I came to America first, I came to California, Los Angeles, and when I had a friend who came with me uh, from Australia, but he was feral like me and quite uh, you know quite. Um, quite a trickster. He, he also likes uh, needling people and trying to, you know, raise their consciousness. So we, we did this as a team sport. And and one of the things we used to do is say, is say this kind of thing to people. It's, it's like saying, you know, just, just challenge their basic assumptions of things like race and say, you know, like, they say like, well, that's racist. And you go like, what's wrong with that? Why shouldn't you be racist? And they, they, nobody ever asked them that question. And they didn't have a good answer. And soon, they would be completely dissembling. And they, they didn't know whether they were Arthur or Martha because they, they, they have all these un, un, um, uh, unexamined assumptions. Yeah, it's like uh, playing devil's advocate, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do that all the time. It's so much fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's, it, it's, it's a great service because it's... Yeah. it's 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 shamanic. It's basically it's it's a sacred role, and it's the role of the fool. Um, and if uh, you know, basically, you're risking your head all the time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but people people do actually like it, and you know, many people came afterwards um, after that era in in Los Angeles and, and thanked me personally and said, you know, you completely turned my world upside down. Well, it's funny you say that because I used to use that method with some psychiatric patients, so-called psychiatric, that used to fall on my lap when I was covering for other doctors. And I would do the same sort of thing, I'd come in for medications and they'd tell me I have, uh, I don't know, uh, paranoid schizophrenia. And I said, I would tell them that, what, 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 is, what is paranoid schizophrenia? Are you... You know, have you questioned that? Uh, wh what is it? And why does it make you sick? And what is wrong about it? And and then little by little, we'd go around, you know, talking about the environment, the world we live in and stuff like that. And I was thanked by a couple of them more oh, 15 years ago. <clears throat> to have pointed out to them that, to have pointed that out to them, to have just got them out of this this kind of, 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 of thinking, of not questioning like racism, uh, uh, psychiatric illness and stuff. I, I know it's it's a fantastic exercise to do. Fantastic. Yeah, to, to question people's base assumptions. Yes. yes. Is, is very, very good. Because people, 
we have all these things that we operate from that we just collected from our culture and what and uh, indoctrination and stuff and there was like it, it and uh you know a lot of them are part of the slave narrative so so in particular the one that comes to mind is being productive like uh, uh, infrequently uh on on reddit you have so people say, you know, oh, that's kind of productive, or no, you know, you got to be positive and be productive, and they say, why? <laughs> and they can't imagine why. You say, look, the last thing this planet needs is more production. Like we've overproduced, we've overconstructed. We need destruction, and basically, we need less production. And people are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so like. Clearly, we've got enough production. We need the opposite now, and that people cannot get that around their head. That just does their head in, because we've told you've got to be productive. You've got to actually, you know, you've got to make money. Your worth in society is by high. being a productive member of society is good. And you say, like, why? Well, because then we've got more stuff. We've got too much stuff. Um, well, I know you would be productive. I can't <laughs> why. Yeah, yeah. It's like you, you ask why, and the whole thing fucking implodes. Yeah, it does. It yeah, because there's, there's it's just it's like why I linked that little cartoon on uh, XR Med. The little girl asks why to her father, and then the alien cortex exploding. He's like, "I'm afraid," and it's like, "Yeah, there you go. That's why we're doing all this. We're afraid." Yeah, well, if only anybody could be that honest, right? Yeah, I, 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 honest. that's what I loved about it. It was so fucking human and honest. I'm like, wow, I have to link this because this is dynamite. Yeah, that was so good. Uh, well, the, I mean, you you think about the what we were talking about, civil rights and stuff like that. Is is uh, you're not allowed to be afraid, right? You say like you say you know say I don't like that race. You say like, well, why not? Because I'm afraid. You say, well, you know, then they try and start an alien cortex argument for why you shouldn't be afraid. And so, like, well, why shouldn't I be afraid? <laughs> but people yeah. people th take it as read that there's the, some idealistic place we need to get to where we all love each other, there's all harmony and stuff. And they're like, I don't think that's a good idea. Look, look, at, um, look at, say, this pandemic, right? The, the very good reasons why we're tribal. One of them is separation from disease and stuff. We, we've got a monoculture that spreads through the whole world. We've put all our eggs in one basket. And we're getting to the stage now where our last hope, according to me, is like indigenous people. And we're giving them COVID. And, you know, the very last gasp of this civilization as it collapses is to give them televisions and cell phones and Bill Gates is in there trying to make sure they get wired and connected. And you say like, I don't, that's a kind of a racism all of its own to say, you know, everybody must be like me. Yeah. I remember uh, seeing a YouTube video of this anthropologist lady and she said that the son Bushman called her radio a devil in a box. It's like, it is a devil in a box. <laughs> they have no time. They have no doubt. Yeah, they yeah. in 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 Africa they couldn't get people to use money because they saw right through it. They like, I know I, know, I get this game. You, it's a con. That makes me think of a movie that was done in the late seventies, early eighties in uh, in Africa, Botswana, and it was called "The Gods Must Be Crazy." I don't know if you have seen it. Story yeah, of yeah, a, I remember it. Yeah, yeah. a bottle of Coke falls from a plane. And he, he, it just falls in the Kalahari and he finds it and he brings it back to his tribe. And it starts this process of madness because he wants to bring the bottle back to the gods. So he has to leave his tribe because it has caused, the bottle has caused terrible grief in the tribe. And it's, it's a really, really good movie if you can watch it. The gods must be crazy. Yeah, yeah I remember it well. Uh, it's, it's a treat. It's a very, very good movie on that. And you see a lot of what we've talked about in it all through the movie. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was it was easier for for us to see in, in South Africa, growing up in, in South Africa. Everything was kind of like on, on high volume. And uh, in, in I think in the Western liberal tradition, everything's a bit too muted. People are not getting the subtleties, <laughs> it's kind of, what, what's happened is that per, slavery and things like that have been perfected. 
the liberal democracy is 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 not like Steven Pinker in that says he said, oh, there are less wars, there's less oppression, there's less slavery. It's it's not actually true. What's really happened is they've they've been integrated and been uh, perfected so that now they're so subtle you can't see them. So it's it's much easier for somebody like me that grew up in Africa to to see them because I've still got my eyes. You can't see the the shades of grey. <laughs> they too they too muted. It's all the violence, though, Hugh, and everything that is very overt in your, for instance, in your South African experience. But I often think that the way uh, the Western societies are living now. The, the net amount of violence hasn't changed. It's simply become psychological violence, not physical violence. And, and I feel it's worse. I feel instinctively that uh, structural violence is infinitely worse than, than ordinary, you know, um, hands-on violence, interpersonal. Yeah, I mean, for an African, somebody growing up in Africa, this, this fetish about non-violence. Is is more than suspicious. It's it's like you know. So like, well, you could you, you say to an African like, oh no, you know, violence is just completely evil. You can't have any violence. They say like, there's always the suspicion of why. <laughs> it's it's almost like saying, oh no, we can't have oxygen. Uh, we can't we we can't have a blue sky. It's yeah, like, I, I, mean, I never. Are you, what are you going to replace violence with? I never agreed with nonviolence either because, yeah, when I was in high school, I got my ass kicked a lot by bullies, and the only way they stopped is when I doubled up my fist and put it in their face. So it's like, you know, you got to be violent sometimes, or they won't stop fucking with you. Uh, yeah, you, you don't want to be you don't want to be a doormat monkey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, this this uh, this thing about uh, that that comes ab about the meek inherit the earth and this uh, Christian stuff is is like Nietzsche said it was uh, it's a slave religion and it's 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 built for oppression. Christianity is evil. It's built for oppression. Yep. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's that's how they do it. They they tell you that um, you know basically you must be meek. You must be why. Because they're exploiting you. They're, they're vampires. Like they, they don't want you to stick up for yourself. And they don't want you to fight back. They want you to be a good sheep and get farmed. So then it says, like, I am the good shepherd and you are my flock. And it's like they're using the words here. Is it like there ain't no good shepherds? They all eat mutton, guys. They all eat mutton. And we're it. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah. I must, I must get on to that next video, which is going to do a bit of Christian bashing. But I'll, I think that'll be the end of me on YouTube. I think I'll get banned from YouTube. Oh, shit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyway. No, so. no, <laughs> don't get banned on YouTube, no. <laughs> you, you, you could try to use a little bit of coded language. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't you, know you how. Know. I, I don't know how. I mean, I think... I, I, I don't know how complaining. either. Oh, if people start complaining, that's the end of well, it. Well, well, well. Here's the thing: I don't think you have to worry too much about Christian Christian bashing because um, there's that whole atheist thing on YouTube, and they just shit all over religion all the time on Islam and stuff. So you might be okay, honestly. I don't think you need to worry about it. Maybe as long as you're not saying like you know destroy a church or whatever, you should be fine. Yeah, because all these guys are doing is like completely shitting on religion from you know the. Uh, the atheist alien cortex point of view, so ah uh, yeah, so so you should be fine, yeah, like it's those Harris and all yeah, those yeah, guys, yeah exactly those guys. So I think you'll be fine. I don't think you'll worry about it. Richard Dawkins, yeah, it's equal opportunity here because I, I spent the last few videos shitting on Dicky Dawkins. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now I can join him in uh, you know, atheism. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> e equal opportunity basher oh, yeah. yes <laughs> but uh yeah so anyway what, what what did we cover enough this 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 time was there was the stuff that other stuff gary was there other stuff you wanted to talk about well um yeah i just have one thing to ask but uh, i think perhaps we should should 
not go too far because everything seems to lead back to this uh, need for the discussion about conspiracy theory because there's so many things in what you said lead in that direction. Um, but uh, maybe just one thing I wanted to ask was in regard to earlier in the conversation with the novelty experiment and, and, a, and a, a shift in consciousness is how we feel our alien cortex self as being the centre of us. If you, if you, you, that's what you feel first. You don't feel your, your real awareness, your real self, as being intimately a part of In other words, what I'm thinking, for a person who's thinking about awakening, it's over there. I've got to reach it. It's away from me. It's not, and yet, and yet, if you if you look at it, that's the most central and intimate part of you. And so we've got this feeling that our alien, our ego self, is the centre of us, and but our real self is somehow over to one side, or it's not. You know, you don't feel that inside you. If you if you insult someone, they feel that centrally. That attack this attack on their ego. If you make an if if they if they have a moment of awareness, um, it's only a moment, and then they go back, and the the the, the centrality of that is lost. Um, so I, I think uh, it, it, I'm just really making a comment. You know that 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 what we really are, we don't feel in the middle of ourselves. The way we feel, the way we feel our our imagined self as being the central part of us. Yeah, that imagined self is wicked. So, what Jung talked about self actualization, and what he meant was integrating all those different parts. And if in reinterpreted in terms of the the layered brain, it meant that you uh, integrated all of them so that they weren't in conflict with each other. Um, and so he kind of represented that as like a mandala. In in his big red book, um, he drew uh, mandalas. He, he, he borrowed a lot from things like the Eastern uh, tradition and Hinduism. And what they would do is they would... They would also, they believed that by meditating and reflecting on a mandala, you could actually integrate all these different parts of you, uh, quite mystic. And even to the extent that uh, your guru could do a mandala. And then, you know, basically he's kind of uh, doing a, almost a mind map of his own mind is, is kind of the thinking, you know, Western interpretation of it. And then the student could actually meditate on that and do a kind of mind meld with, you know, um, by fusing that mandala in their own thinking, uh, just by um, reflecting on it enough, meditating on, on enough. Yeah, um, I was thinking about mandalas and how, e even there in that analogy, that you tend to think, you still tend to automatically place your ego self right in the center and where you're trying to get at in terms of awakening is somewhere on the periphery instead of in, Turning that completely around, trying to feel, try to trying to feel yourself, your real self, in the center. I so mean, we, it's a, we, you can't really, if you tell the truth, and all of this is really the way the way to liberation is radical truth telling. But if you tell yourself the truth, you have to admit if you if you think about what really exists. Really, that point of ego is an absolute. So that point of ego that you're talking about is is not something to deny or something to uh, to think of yourself as uh, you know to try and get to an ego that's on some far horizon or some some liberation on some horizon. It is to go inward to that ego. So that ego is what they would call the Atman, and that is the universal self. But it's also a jiva, the personal self, right? So the Atman is is inescapably between <laughs> between your two ears, in in the Krishna tradition, and that they'd say it's in your heart, but I, it doesn't doesn't feel that way to me. 
but <laughs> there is a there is a basis. Um, I mean, there's a, a real scientific basis for it, and it's if you go to cosmology and the modern understanding of the Big Bang theory, I like to fool with people and say to them, you know, like, okay, you've got this Big Bang, so you know, everything is like streaming out from one point. Uh, so where is that point? Like, if you if you went put a little signpost, maybe you know, people could have you know tours to the center of. <coughs> <clears throat> to the center of the universe. You say the center of the universe is right here. This is the point where everything is expanding away from. And, uh, you know, you could, you know, get a get a round-trip ticket to go and see it. It'd be a great tourist attraction in the center of the universe. You say, well, where is that? Is it in the Milky Way? Is it just off Andromeda? Which is the closest galaxy? Where would you have to go? Does anybody have an answer? Do they know the answer to this? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it, it always seems like I think they said something like um, the center of the universe is your point of reference, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it, it's so so what they've been saying this age is for thousands of years, maybe eight thousand they claim <laughs> has ha, ha, came um, popped out in the last century <laughs> in Western cosmology, and they said every single point. Has has a claim to be the center of the galaxy and or center of the universe, not just the galaxy, and has an equal claim. So that's kind of weird because if you go to the center of Andromeda, which is like the next door galaxy, anywhere you are in Andromeda, it looks like the Milky Way is disappearing from you and you're the center. And if you stand here on Earth inside the Milky Way, it looks like the exact opposite. And you say, which one is right? And the answer is they're all correct. So it comes back very close to the whole idea of the Brahma would be the entire universe. But you see, there's no way that Brahma, the universe can't experience itself. It needs some kind of mechanism. It needs eyes and ears. It needs basically a nervous system in a way. Some, some kind of localized mechanism to experience its infinite self and then that's the atma so it's kind of like you know the universe could not experience itself unless it did it through you and then you have you're in a bit of as soon as you come to that realization you're in a bit of trouble straight out and the reason is is how many yous are there well if you're really really fucking honest there's only one there's only you right if you do, if you think like Descartes, and you say, "What do I really know?" If I, if I, I don't assume anything. I don't ha assume other minds. I don't assume other people have shit going on in their heads. Like, what do I really, really know? All I know, I'm dreaming these other people. So, what do I really know? Well, Descartes said, "You know, je pense donc je suis." I think, therefore, I am. He said, one thing you know is that you are thinking, you are experiencing this. You are asking your question. That you know. No one can take that away from you, is that you are experiencing what you're experiencing while you're asking this question of basically, who is this person? So then you say, well, at least I know that. You don't know whether other people exist or not. But if you can thoroughly acknowledge yourself and say then, well, what is it? You say, well... So all I know is I'm sitting between my two ears experiencing this universe. It seems like a dream. It seems like you're in the matrix and you're generating the matrix and experiencing it at the same time. Your awareness of the universe is, is what creates it. Right? And that's all you really know is basically you seem to be a simulator and creating the universe and observing it at the same time. So there really is only one Atman. Atman is not duplicated. And that Atman is you. So it's intensely solipsistic. That basically you are in your own movie. You're the projector and you're actually the movie itself. So the, it's, it's completely interluded. But once you get to that state, that's a very divine state. That's complete and utter solipsism. So it's the kind of solipsism that says it, it annihilates your fear of death because it's saying like, well, as the... As the experiencer of the universe, I can't really die. I assume I die because I see lots of examples and I can feel myself getting older. So I assume I'm going to die. But 
I don't really know that for a fact, but I, I assume that that's the case. But it doesn't seem that way. If you if you have this complete solipsism, then it's saying, well, well, what would really happen is the only one thing you're really sure of is your own experience of the universe. So the, so you can't imagine that experience nullified. Therefore, when you die, it's not you dying. It's the universe going away. So in that inversion, you become the only thing that exists. And so you're saying, I cannot die because I cannot experience death. And basically what must be happening is the universe is like a dream going away. So it's for some unknown reason, I exist. I started having this dream of the universe. And then I assume at some stage the dream will end and it'll go away and it'll just be me existing. <laughs> It's sort of like that uh, thing, like, I think it was like Alan Watts said something like, oh, death, is, I think death is like going to sleep after, uh, um, or waking up after having never gone to sleep and going to sleep and never waking up. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. The, the, the main thing is that that it's, it's we have a conception in, in ego before, say, on the progression of the octave, before do re mi, before the mi and the octave boundary there, is before that step, which you can call self-realization, is, is we have this idea that we exist as a jiva in the world. The world endures, and we're going to snuff out. So we have the point of view of what most people think of us. Because we can watch other people snuff out, but you can't watch yourself snuff out. If you try and watch yourself snuff out and die, just as you get to the exciting part, you're dead. <laughs> so you never get to see it. <laughs> so we assume, back to front view, that we can see people dropping dead left and right, and we assume that that's what will happen to us. So we assume that the prima mater and the universe endures, and we're about to drop, up, drop dead. But that can't be so, because basically we couldn't experience that as a reality. We could. There's no way you can experience death that way. So, so for the Atman, for us, if we're really honest, the universe dies. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was uh, possibly. <laughs> oh, Nisa Gadata, that's right, made the comment. He said uh, nothing that was real ever died. Um. Which I guess sums it, that up. It's a not. Bit. It's not the entire truth, but it is a stepping stone towards, you know, basically really being one with the universe. Is is you saying, you know, we don't really understand what the hell's going on, and uh, in terms of consciousness, is something to do with electromagnetism because you can prove it just by the fact that if I if I stop all electrical activity in your head, you just completely not there. If you've ever been put under anesthetic, you know that. You're just not there. <laughs> it's like there's, when you when you revived again, it's just an empty space. It's just like you don't have any memory. You don't have any memory of a gap. It's really under deep anesthetic. You're really not there. So it's a proof that when there's no electrical activity in your, in your brain, there's no consciousness. But if all we are is really consciousness, so if you say, well, then, um, uh, you know, how does electricity just do its thing? Basically, you know, neurons pop, pop on and off. And Kayabanga, there I am, having the, the observations and thoughts. No one has a damn clue why. But that certainly seems to be the case. This is something to do with uh, electromagnetism and, you know, energy transfers going on in space. So yeah, it's likely a, a a reflection of a much more subtle process, like a um, how could I put it, like a parallel in 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 the more material realm of something that that is using finer energy. Um, well, I mean, I wouldn't say it's funny. It's just it's just energy, right? So energy can be transferred into other stuff, but it's just energy. And so you say, well, why does energy experience itself? 
you know, why when we look at the sun, we're looking at a big ball of energy, it's mainly electromagnetic and fusion and stuff. But why is are all these energy transfers just winding up as a conscious experience? And when when you start to ponder that enough, then you can get to the one of the universe because you say, well, you know, you're an aggregation of, you know, chinops, you know, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphor, sulfur. And it's like, it that's not going anywhere when you die, right? It's still there, all your body materials there. It just gets, you know, transferred into other states of energy and stuff. But it's it, there's no molecule that exists now that doesn't exist after you're dead. And in fact, even the energy will be just passed on to, to other energy states as far as we know. So you say like, well, you're just kind of an aggregation of the stuff that the universe does and energy passing through it. It's almost, so, oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so I mean, you, you get to a stage where you think, well, well, you know, I just come together like an illusion, almost like a fish, you know, basically in a shoal coming together and making the impression of a big fish when, you know, or a flock of birds coming together and making, a, a, you know, a pattern in the sky and then dispersing again. So you kind of aggregate together, you get a whole lot of electri electrical activity and then you disperse again. But there, there's no real loss in that, but there's the, while the, while all those things come together, then the eye can see itself, then the universe can see itself. And apparently that's the only way it gets to see itself is through our eyes. So we, we literally are the gods. We literally are the Atman. Yeah, so it's that coming together, that aggregation that gives rise to the separate consciousness or the yeah, but, but, yeah. but then you see other people also disappear when you you step out of the solipsism because yeah. because you can see that although you don't have access to the electromagnetism and stuff going on in people's heads you, you can infer it's you know electron is an electron i don't i i strongly suspect that um there's not more than one electron. I think the electrons, the photons, there's only one. They, they, Richard Feynman had that idea too, and he, he didn't pursue it. I think maybe Herman Weil also had that idea. But at various times, physicists have come to the conclusion, like, maybe there, there is only one electron, um, and uh, it's, it's just kind of duplicating itself. And... Um, I think that the, that's correct. The, Richard Feynman didn't pursue it because he couldn't make the maths work. <laughs> but the, the, reason, the reason why you can't make the maths work is because it's fractal and involuted. So that's... that's uh, but even to go that far here into the necessity to, to create anything material in the universe at all, there's no necessity for that. If it, can, if it can all be dreamed, dreamed is not a good word for it, but why Why does anything material, there's, there's no need for it to be there. I mean, the, the, the simple way I put it is that why would God bother making stuff when he can just, you, 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 can, you can experience everything without stuff. It can just, it's any good or wrong. No, no, you can't. You can't experience anything without stuff. That's the whole point. That's why we are stuff. You see, nothing, unless you have electromagnetism going around, if, if you've got photons or electrons just in a beam, they ain't doing deadly yeah. stuff. Yeah, I'm thinking more of like, you have a, you could, there's a certain kind of dream you can have which is uh, extremely convincing. And people have had these kinds of dreams where, you know, for instance, they solve some kind of problem, some terribly complex problem it, during the dream. And it's, it's absolutely satisfactory on, on every level and completely convincing. And then they wake up and find that it was just not just nonsense. Uh, but, the, you know, uh, the... At a, at a certain level, isn't our, our reality operating that way? 
that it's only got to be yeah. convincing. It doesn't really need to be anything. Yes. Yeah, so you you can you can tell a lot about pe people's spiritual status and and advance by how they talk about solipsism. So you 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 get people that are very you know kind of alien cortex and not very well steeped in the concept. No, their understanding is shallow, and and they say, well, solipsism isn't valid because you know. Um, you can, uh, you know, the Shakespeare and Mozart exist, and you don't have the skill or talent to duplicate Mozart or or Shakespeare. You you see that argument sometimes. It's a very shallow argument because you. It's like saying the the best way to understand solipsism is is to think of it like you're talking about it as a dream, so like a dream you had last night. So then what they're saying is ridiculous because what they're saying is, well, solipsism can't be the case because, you know, I had a dream last night of Mozart. And then somebody will say, like, you can't have dreamed of Mozart. And I said, yeah, I did. He was there playing the piano. And he said, no, you can't have because you don't have the talent to play a piano as well as Mozart. Therefore, you couldn't have dreamed of Mozart. So I said, it's it's ridiculous. Of course, you can dream of Mozart on the piano, even if you don't even know how to compose music. But further to what you were just alluding to is, it's not even necessary that you even have the ability to imagine Mozart playing music. You could you you also, as the observer, can ma manufacture as part of the dream that I I dreamed it was fantastic music <laughs> as well. Yeah. So. The yeah. So the value judgment and the qualification of the dream itself is also in the dream. So it means everything is in this hermeneutical circle. So, it really is yeah. part of the, the dream. So so yeah. solipsism is inviolate, it is absolute. And there's no way of proving that that you you're not having a dream. So the the way of dreaming this entire world like a virtual simulation. So what you were saying were then about why? Why would God create stuff to do that? And the traditional answer was for delight. It, basically, this was in 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 terms of Advaita Vedanta that the whole universe was considered leela, and it was considered the play. And so it's like it's the same reason why you watch YouTube, Netflix, and go to the movies. It's like this is God's way of going to the movies. So, so God has the power to create the universe and experience it at the same time, and just does it for so onanistic self masturbation. <laughs> it's basically what the universe is. Or, more politely put, it's just God enjoying God. But if you spend enough time uh, doing these exercises, particularly the first one, instead of grounding yourself you can get to the stage where you really feel that. So I think, good to... Yeah, but I mean, in a way, Hugh, with those exercises, um, you come to a point of awareness. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. But, yes, you do, but it's not an experience. You don't know that in the same way. You, you can't... You can't um, because there's not two, you, there's not two of you at that point. Exactly. Just, your, dualis, your dualism collapses. And yeah, so, that's outside Vaito Vedanta. Yeah, right there. Yeah. That's why I put up that video. I, I mean, I know it was rather, yeah. rather religiously dealt with, but I was just trying to draw attention to some of those concepts. That's all. Um, but and so you can't. Um, can you, when you're in, when you're like that, you can't. Give a description of that. You get, you know, any and the part of you that gives descriptions of things isn't there anymore. You, you, and you've, you, in a way, you've yeah. left the material. You've left the the whatever you would call it, the manifest universe, and and you're you're in a state where uh, you can't describe it. It's it just it doesn't have it. It's it's like I think what they're in the Advaita, where they're talking about uh, the, just the Brahman, but the Brahman must be beyond qualities. Uh, no, it's it, no, it's not quite beyond qualities. So, so 
it has the quantity of Satchitananda. So, so consciousness, knowledge, and bliss. So, so it's really a state of transcendence. If you do that exercise enough, you'll get to a point. I think it was Gurdjieff that said. So somebody asked him, like, when when will I know that I'm? I might be making this up, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, somebody asked Gurdjieff, "This is like when? When do I know that I'm enlightened?" And he's, I th he said something like. Um, when you on a bicycle riding down the road and you realize that you're the absolute or the Atman riding on the Atman through the Atman for the joy of the Atman, then you know. But that in that in includes such a tenanda. So then you would have uh such is, is consciousness. So you know that you're riding the bicycle. If, if you're dreaming, and that's what we're doing, that's why this thing about the novelty exercises, if, if you're dreaming about where you're going or the cars around you while you're riding a bike or you're thinking about your bank balance or how you're late for work or something, you're not really on your bike. If you're consciously on your bike and you, you, everything that's filling your head is really the sensory experience of being on your bike and that's all, then that's consciousness. So then, then knowledge is the knowledge of observing that. You basically, you know you're on your bike. So, so you're not just riding your bike and conscious uh, and having the experience. You know that it's you on the bike. It's knowledge of self riding the bike. You you have no doubt that you are riding the bike, and that experience then leads naturally to bliss. And then they, that's what traditionally they say is that Ananda is the natural state of bliss. If there's nothing else cocking it up. <laughs> oh wait, you uh, muted. Sorry, uh, aren't you at some stage in process of going through Satchitananda? You, you, you abandon the... Um, you, you, I mean, you, be, you have to... It has to be a unitary thing occur, doesn't there? You can't simultaneously be aware of what you're doing and doing it as two separate things. This, this, you, you're no, coming it, to a point it's, of it's completely integrated. It's completely yeah. Integrated. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's it's like it's uh, Americans have this annoying habit of saying you know like you might be at Disneyland or something, and they say, "Hey kids, are you having fun?" And that always used to really annoy me because it's just kind of like I was having fun till you said that. <laughs> and so you started thinking, "Am I having fun or not?" That fucking ruined the fun. That's why, I, I mean, we can't do it now here. It's why I wanted to have the discussion going back to that that uh, original thing uh, when Ekubeni made his little bit of comment and you said, I bet you weren't awake while you were writing that. And that led to this thought about the different ways of being conscious of yourself and what you're doing. Um, and you know what what you've done there is like the, the example of the people on, on a ride at the fair and that spoils it for them because it cracks them out of their their complete um enjoyment of it and makes them self-conscious in a way and so you've got you've got like you know I mean, I had a whole list, but we can't go through it now, of being absorbed in something, immersed in something, being distracted, being inadvertent, and then you go on being self-conscious. And then they're, they're, they're um, dualistic consciousnesses. Um, you know, and they, so when you're getting on further to what we're just saying about the observer and and the uh, the process of going through existence, consciousness, bliss, um, and yet you're not you don't not know that, but it's not the same as a self conscious awareness. 
So yeah, this is self-conscious awareness. So if you if you just aware of some object, then you're fascinated, right? So you're captivated by that object. You might walk into a church or something like that and be completely overwhelmed, awestruck. Now that kind of awe is is hypnotism. It's a, it's really you you sleep. You outside yourself in that stuff in in what you're observing. You lost. So this is uh, where you're not lost. You you actually there. It's it's exactly like making love, right? So it's 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 like imagine it like making love. It's like the world is your partner, the Leela, the universe is your partner. You you can be completely lost and absorbed in them, which is kind of uh, too much transference. It's basically you've lost yourself in in the other. Which is kind of a lower level of consciousness. You can be entirely in yourself and objectivizing your lover, in which case that's kind of egotistical and not a very um, high level of consciousness. But there's a unitary consciousness where you, in your own socks and shoes, you're in your own skin. Uh, you know, it's making true love to a partner. Uh, and I mean this case, not just physical. I mean, there's like the universe I'm talking about. So it's basically, you, there's no separation in that highest form of consciousness and love. There's no separation between you, the object, and basically the unification of the two, right? So there's, there's um, it's a complete unitary experience, but it, you can't leave the self out of it. Otherwise, that's partial, right? So it's it's not partial at all. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just trying to to it, it, because it, you know there's this tendency to think that that's an experience. But if you say that it's an experience, then it's the, it's the, it is an experience because it has a beginning and an end. So hmm. in a way, it's not really real, but in in another way, it's uh, the substrate of everything that's going on. I mean, it's as it's as real as things get. So, you know, awareness can't be just a burning light that just sits like a lantern and an eternal flame, just always on. It it must uh, wax and wane and take on different forms and colors and and hues and attributes, right? It, it's basically, you know, light does play in that way. You can't just have one solid shining burning light with um, no. it just stays stays yeah. constant. It's it's got to come into focus and go now. And then that that is well, at least while we're alive. I mean, that's what life is is the is the enjoyment of that and those yeah. those transformations as as it um, kind of flickers, you know. But the 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 light has to, you know, the light of consciousness has to um, shine on something and, and be transformed as it goes. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's, there's, there, if there was no change, there would be no action. And if there was no action, there wouldn't, it's death, you know, you wouldn't be conscious. So it's, consciousness can only see the changes. You can only see energy um, playing in space, right? So, so there has to be some movement and play of energy for the for the mind to see itself. Yeah, that's that's uh, the see? thing alive, right? Yeah, it's like uh, don't just watch the fireflies go play with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but you you can't just have a, a firefly in empty space. It, the fireflies have to move and they have to play to to exist. Yeah. You know, like. Light, light, light has to move. <laughs> there is a speed of light that's C, and you can't freeze it, right? It's yeah. like putting moonbeams in a jar. You can't put a moonbeam in a jar. Would you say that that uh, for consciousness to know itself, things would need to occur? But if nothing is occurring, it doesn't mean that consciousness has stopped existing. It just does. It just not known it doesn't um uh i'm just thinking of consciousness as like the prima mater of the universe it still needs to be there 
for when something starts up. Um, it's like when you're asleep, you know, and you wake up and you don't, you don't, uh, you know, you're awake because something is manifesting in consciousness, something's occurring. But when you're asleep, the anal I guess the analogy is, well, nothing was occurring, so consciousness lost awareness of itself because there was yeah. just nothing. It didn't go away. It just wasn't aware of itself because nothing was occurring. It it does appear that way, but it's uh, it's beyond what I know. I mean, I, I was just yeah. born, then I experienced this life, and I assume I'll yeah. die soon. And then basically, I I have no way of knowing whether you know that's all that ever was. It was just mm. complete non-existence, complete non-blackness. Then the first yeah. memory I had, all the way up until the last, and that's it. That's I have no yeah. way of knowing. You don't know that. Whether yeah. That is yeah. the be all and end all, and it was just some blip in eternity. <laughs> no yeah. one knows, at least for me, what that was. So you can't really answer mm. that question. At all, really, no, no one can know. It's beyond, it's beyond consciousness. It's kind of like seeing yeah. outside the bubble. Yeah, I suppose you just sort of infer it because you wake up the next day and you appear to be the same person you were the day before. So there was some kind of continuity that was going on, even though you weren't there. Um, yeah, the consciousness seems to be unitary, right? And it does seem seem to persist. So the reason why mm -hmm. we think of ourselves as the same person is because uh, consciousness is singular. And so if you think of an experience, you know, basically when you, you know, if you have a clear memory of when you're an, a nine-year-old, you think, was, was that the same person experiencing it? Mm -hmm. it, it appears mm -hmm. to be, yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't appear that 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 observer. I mean, I, I have no sense at all that that observer has changed. I mean, the attributes have changed. I, if I think back to a memory of when I was nine years old, then then it's the same person observing. There's a lot of other stuff around it. A lot of interpretation, a lot of attributes and kind of ornaments that have been hung around uh, the the person that I am today that experiences things. But the raw experience of if you smell or hear, um, whatever the observer of that is, it doesn't seem to have changed throughout your whole life, right? Yeah, that's what uh, um, I was listening to a thing just the other day. Rupert Spire was talking about basically that, that the, the, the sense of yourself as a child and as, as you got progressively older, what what is the feeling? The feeling of yourself has always remained the same. It hasn't changed. All this other stuff has gone on, but but what you feel as yourself has remained the same the whole time. And I think he was trying to sort of connect that to a sense of um, the continuity of your consciousness. That 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 feeling that 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 feeling of of what was continuous is not you, the person. It's the feel. It, it is the the presence of your 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 true self that, that yeah. hasn't gone away and hasn't been changed by anything. You know that that what they say something like you know it, it doesn't arise and it doesn't disappear. It's just sort of always there, and we feel that in ourselves as the continuity of ourselves. Yeah, as, so that's called aham in in Hinduism, and it, in Sanskrit it essentially means I am. So it's very interesting because um, you know in Genesis it says you know who who are you know Moses asked the burning bush who you who are you, God and he says I I am that I am basically he's saying you know I. I am. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> I am. <laughs> and that's essentially hum is exactly like that. Now, hum is, is that feeling of a hum or I am is the same as Brahma. And it's, it's the it's essen, essential feeling that really the only consciousness in the universe has, which is you, solipsistic you. And, um, and then all, all everything else is a hamkara. 
and that means a hum with Kara's attribute sheath. They often talk about a sheath. So it's this kind of analogy of you surrounded by the sheath of different attributes, experiences, all these kind of accoutrements, um, you know, a changing body, all that kind of thing. They, they're all the, aspects of yeah. ego, right, that are the changing. coloring of consciousness. Yeah. yeah. So they, yeah. Yeah, all, of, all of those things are the attributes of consciousness, and then those are considered unreal because they're changing all the time. So you can't get back to how you were when you were a kid or, um, you know, every time you experience something that's an ego attachment, it is a hankara. And that, that is kind of like a blind on the essential aham. It's kind of like a bunker on the essential aham. It's a qualification of it. So, so in, in terms of Jungian philosophy, then uh, the self-actualization or the completing of the mandala is when there's no other uh, uh, karas, you know, there's no, there are no attributes. It's just this pure light without obstacles. And a lot of the work that, that we're doing here is removal of those obstacles. So they, the reason why in Hinduism they pr pray to Ganesh, uh, Ganesha is um, the... Ganesh is the elephant god, and yeah. it's the remover of obstacles. So they say that basically all these ob obstacles are these minor identifications, all these kind of things, um, our ego attachments and all our delusions of what we think we are, um, you know, temporary things, uh, identification with, with rank and race and our body identification, all the many identifications we have. Then, then those are removed with those, this work. With, and then that's uh, considered who's removing this, and nobody really knows. That's why they just say the elephant god. <laughs> um, yeah, but there's also the fact that you, 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 if you've removed things, you, you, in a sense, have to get back in tune with what you are before before those attributes. In other words, that come back to that feeling of your, that continuous feeling of yourself. So I think that's what's too, too hidden from us. We, we, we don't, it, it, we're not usually subtle enough to, to feel that. We, we, we feel the phenomena, but we don't feel ourselves. Well, um, you can feel the blockage. What these things, these obstacles are really uh, neuroses, right? So they, they are things that are kind of like shutting off the the light of consciousness is one analogy that they, they often say. And so the way to see them is kind of a nexus of complication. We have all these in our thinking, we have uh, kind of knots in our thinking. We have these contradictions. We have like we have in one little frame in an alien cortex, we have, uh, you know, this, this um, set of concepts and it actually contradicts what we have in the next door frame, but the two frames never really meet, and the gap between them is kind of a, um, a neurosis. It's an, a, a complex that we have. Uh, it's just a little tangle. So if you, with enough reflection, then you get frame A to talk to frame B, and eventually everything just kind of disappears because you just get an open circuit, and it's kind of like open mic all the way through. So that's uh, ironing out all those wrinkles and nexuses is, is really what Jung and Freud were doing. And it's the same stuff as, as this. But you, you have those in, in yourself and we have those in our society. We have all these little knots and politics and stuff and factionalism and stuff. So it's ironing out all those factions in your, your head till eventually they're unified. And one of the things that happens once you, you iron those out is you get a lot of energy because it's kind of like the, your, your head's really like a swamp. It's kind of like a mangrove swamp. And the water doesn't really flow in it because there's so many tangles. But as you smooth out each one of these tangles from reflection and observation and stuff, the water starts to flow. <laughs> and the, it's an analogy for energy but the, or consciousness, but then it starts to flow. And it, quite literally, uh, it it means it's it has a physical... Um, 
manifestation in your neurons. So you, you're the, the energy does actually flow as electricity in your neurons. You will get more, eventually you have an epileptic fit. It's basically kind of an overload. It's kind of like the grid has too much electricity in it. And you will get to that stage. That's the shortcuts to it, like using LST or some hallucinogens and stuff like that. But, but I wouldn't recommend them because you're not really you're not really getting the kinks out of the grid and you're not really ironing out the complexes. You're just, you know, putting a massive it's amount of energy through it. Yeah. yeah you just, you're short circuiting yeah. all the, you're just short circuiting yeah. bits of your brain, which is not really what you want to do. You want to iron out all the little nexuses and complexes, and then you have this free flow of electricity that then will give you that uh, hallucinogenic experience without, um, any artificial aid, and so then that's the point. You want to get to that. When, once that happens, it's like, yeah, never really goes back again. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't have to do gardening all every day on that school. <laughs> yeah, you just have to um, have, happen once, right? Yeah. Here it's quite a long. Talk. It's, it's yeah. Should be it there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I probably shouldn't have brought that in late in the, uh, late in the oh, That day. was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> well, 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 yeah, that was... I'm getting tired because it's too long. But I wish, I wish I had yeah. all that energy and continue because we've gone from we've gone far there. Do you know? Yeah, we did a lot of. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I wish it's... I'm not tired now. Jesus. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's sort of like being consciously like being a bird in a cage and figuring out the bars and getting rid of them so you can, you know, fly. Mm. Sort of, right? Yeah. Yeah, you, but but to see the the all these are inside us. So they yeah. kind of like we have these kind of ganglions uh in our neural network and you need to tease them out so that uh basically you can get a bit of energy flowing. <laughs> yeah. This is I take it this is what they mean in, in the Hindu idea of clearing nadis, you know, yeah, clearing it. your, your yeah. energetic blockages. This is just another way of describing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, um, and chakras. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, yeah, chakras are yeah. kind of a wheel. It's like spaghetti junction. But yeah. the, the, yeah. the nadis yeah. are, are just nerves, right? So, yeah. So it's basically, but then, yeah, they would call what you're clearing out, they call it shashumna. And so it's mm. it's really this kind of fine energy which they would associate with breath, but yeah, that, that yeah. was their physiology. It's not ours in the West anymore. We think in terms of nerves and electrical impulses. Um, yeah, that's why I'm rather attracted to their their descriptions in a way because you know we get very top heavy with scientific just, um, understanding of these things, but then when you look back so far into the past and see that they could explain it perfectly well without having that scientific knowledge, and it was absolutely as effective. Um, yeah, they, they're describing it from the inside. So, so mm. they're describing it how it feels like, and then yeah. in the West we describe it objectively where, what you get when you dissect. Yeah, well, you see, there's, they're not they are being perfectly scientific they're just being scientific with their feelings rather than scientific with their test tubes i guess yeah they're giving you know? a user manual from the inside of what it's yeah. what it feels yeah. like when, <laughs> when you get it right and so well, it's 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 more useful because it's more like um a personal map um that that's mm. it's kind of like a, a graphic map for for the user to to navigate as opposed to like an accurate um orthogonal map you know which is what we would use in the west so it's kind of like a, a, tre a pirate's treasure map that's kind of uh, based on human <laughs> the human experience and uh, as opposed to but, like Mercator projection well, which is yeah. yeah but i mean you know the the thing is so it's more authentic isn't it because the, the the most authentic thing for you is what you feel, and you you you're basing the, the whole exploration on that. Because yeah. What, what I yeah. Is, is all I know. 
you know. Yeah, it's it's easier post- to navigate off, off one of these personal maps than it is to navigate off a Mercator projection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, I just feel an attraction to that process because it seems to be more original and more authentic. Yeah, and it goes all the way back to the shamans. I mean, I think that's mm, what the shamans mm. were doing in the caves where, you know, they, yeah. they, they said it in terms of the spirit, but what they're showing is initiates what, what they will encounter on a spiritual journey. So they're saying, you yeah. know, like, you will come to the elk god and the, they have the elk god in the thing and they animate yeah. the, uh, the, the picture on the wall, a mural with a, with a torch, and they say, you know, the elk god will ask you this, and then you respond that, and <clears> they, <throat> they teach them, like, that. I think that's what they were doing. Then, then, then they initiate it when they start on this kind of work, then it suddenly all makes sense to them. And it makes mm. sense in terms of Jungian archetypes and that, and they say, in terms of feelings, and then they get, oh, it's not a literal elk god that, manifests itself it's it's a metaphor and you go i get it i get it that feelings the elk this things and so it's it's kind of what i'm doing with what i'm saying with the the layered brain and so it's so like the, the image of so, the bull in in uh, it's like the image of the bull that you used previously yeah yeah exactly so at some stage you see the like panel four seeing the bull well that then you get oh it's a metaphor for the alien cortex now i get it it's and you know yeah. You experience mm-hmm. the alien cortex. You understand the thinking part. You clearly can can visualize it. You can see it and working in front of you. Uh, but I could have I could have said you know like well you know on the journey we'll find this fierce dragon and the dragon has these attributes and stuff. And all I'm doing is describing the 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 say reptilian brain. Then at some mm-hmm. stage you'd go like. Oh, that's what you said. Oh, I get it. The, the dragon's a metaphor for the my reptilian part in me. I got mm-hmm. it. Again. See, mm-hmm. they, they're doing that with um, uh, with uh, alchemy as well. Alchemy it was all a metaphor that they translate into chemistry. Like scientists yeah. don't realize that now. They think it was proto chemistry. It's now there's nothing to do with that. It was spiritual mm-hmm. development. So what what they did was they would get say. Quicksilver, mercury, and then some other elementary compound, and they would put them together, and they'd say that was a metaphor for what happened when you basically did this kind of spiritual practice. Yeah, and then yeah. so then you would suddenly identify, and you would get the you, they would give you a key so that you would know, just like I've given you the key that like when I say big dragon and I tell you all about the big dragon, I'm talking about your reptilian brain. So they would they would give you those keys, and then the penny would finally drop while you're sitting there doing these al- alchemical experiences and probably getting a bit high on the fumes. Then suddenly it would all make sense to you. And the reason why they did it was they they felt that there was the archetypes were not particular to your head. They felt that they were universal, and you could even find them in elementary substances. So, so they thought, you know, mixing your heart and head and your a, a, say your primate brain and your mammalian brain mixing them together would turn you into this kind of person and then they could do it with saying well this is mercury represents this and mars represents this hematite and then you put them together and they make this amalgam and then say well that's analogous to what happens when you do this kind of union so the so jung recovered all of that and made this kind of alchemy um, and um, didn't go down well because we're too literal minded now. <laughs> but that that was how how uh, yeah it. The problem is that we we're too screwed up in academia today because we take what should be metaphor as literal and we take what's what was meant literally as metaphor. So we kind of can't understand it at all. But. With a bit of experience, you like uh, Jung went far enough to recover what they were talking in psychological terms. Then he raided it and became famous for all these comments, you know, new concepts and stuff. It's like he's just a fucking plagiarist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well. Anyway, um, well, that was long. <laughs> that was long. Yeah. Yeah. That's the longest meeting ever. We had. Uh-huh. It and is. now observe as I trick us back into another 15 minutes. Just kidding. Don't ask any more. I'm hungry. 
Yeah, yeah, it's half a dinner. Well, no, no, what you mean is, Sophie, what you mean is, my reptilian brain wants and a burger. Wants and, to be and smell something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's very really enlightened conversation. And, and, and my primate brain wants to trick us into another 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, to, just to be mischievous. <laughs> yes, I know. I know what you mean. My alien cortex says, fuck, look at the time. <laughs> Nobody's talking about the mammalian brain here. <laughs> I, I feel one. sorry for all of you. Oh, <laughs> <that's the mammalian laughs> <brain. Yeah. laughs> Excellent. I think, I think that was primate brain. I think that was... A, <laughs> oh, was, was that primate brain? brain. <laughs> sarcasm. Uh, the, the mammalian brain is maybe like, let's all have a vote. <laughs> <laughs> take, take pity on all of us and let, let us go. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very guys. much. Thank right. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. So okay, good thanks. Have a good day. Bye,